Hello and welcome to the Data Protection, Disaster Recovery, and Disaster Recovery as a Service Megacast event. Today is February 13th, 2019. On today's event, you'll be hearing from an expert in disaster recovery, Mr. Dave Chapa of the CTE Group, in our keynote kickoff. After that, you'll hear from presenters at Cohesity, Pure Storage, iLand, Veeam, Clear Sky, DataCore, NetApp, Unitrends, and Igneous. Wow, what an incredible event we have lined up for you today. I want to make sure I thank everyone out there in the audience for taking time out of your busy schedule to join us on today's event. Today's event is produced by Actual Tech Media. Now, my name is David Davis. I'm the moderator for today's event. I've been in the industry a long time, writing, blogging, speaking. I'm a 10-time VMware V expert. And in case you can't tell in my voice, I'm passionate about all things enterprise technology. Being a former IT manager myself, I get really excited about technology solutions that can help companies to be more efficient, to save time, to save money, and to solve your technology challenges. And today's topic on data protection and disaster recovery is especially cool. And while you're learning on this event today, you have a chance to win one of our very valuable prizes, which I'll be talking about in just a moment. So the format of today's event, if you haven't joined us before, is that each of the presenters will speak for roughly 20 minutes, followed by a live three to five minute Q&A session. During that session, I'll be asking the best questions from you out there in our audience. So thank you for your questions in advance. This event is not a competition between the presenters. There's no winner being selected here today. Again, this is an educational event. Before we jump into it, we've got a little bit of housekeeping to cover. First off, prizes. We've got some really cool prizes. I'll talk about those prizes and exactly how to be eligible for the prize drawings in just a moment. Next up, questions. We'll be asking you a number of questions during the event. These poll questions are for your benefit as well as ours. We want to help to make future events as useful and relevant to you as possible. So we're very interested in your answers. And I'll be sharing the answers to most of the poll questions with you so you can see how you stack up with those out there in the audience. We also encourage you to ask questions. As I said, I'll be taking the best questions during the live Q&A sessions with each of our presenters. So use that questions and answers box as much as you'd like. We'll be trying to respond to every question as they come in. And I'll be queuing up the product specific questions or technology questions for each of the presenters. We also want this to be a social event. So we encourage you to promote this event on Twitter. You can do that with today's hashtag, which is cloud megacast. I'll be reminding you of that hashtag in just a minute. You should know I'll be monitoring the hashtag throughout the event over on Twitter. I'll be retweeting your posts and following just about anyone who posts using the hashtag. And then finally, we have a number of resources or handouts selected, you can click on the handouts tab, which is right next to the questions and answers tab on your audience console. If you click on each one of those handouts, you'll download the corresponding PDF asset, or you'll be taken to the website that's been provided by today's presenter. So make sure that you check out those handouts. You should know that your audience console that you're viewing there in your web browser is kind of like a windowed operating system where you can drag, maximize, minimize, and resize all of the windows that you see there. In fact, I encourage you to make the slides window as large as possible so that when today's presenters play videos or they show architectural diagrams or do screen shares, you can see those as large as possible in your web browser. If at any point during the presentation you have trouble, simply press refresh on your browser and nine times out of 10, that will resolve any technical problem that comes up. If a refresh does not resolve it, in many cases, you can simply try another web browser and most of the time that will resolve it. If it doesn't, send us a question in the questions and answers area. Now, just a reminder, this is a completely live event. Things can and sometimes do go wrong on live events. So if there is a problem, I ask in advance that you please be patient with us. We have presenters calling in from around the United States and in some cases around the world. But it is my expectation that this will be a perfect event today. During today's event, we'll be giving out six of the new Mac Minis for your home lab. These are the 3.2 gigahertz i7 models with 16 gigs of RAM and 128 gigs of flash storage. Keyboard and mouse are not included, but yes, these are the awesome brand new relatively recently announced Mac Mini. So make sure you stay tuned for those prize drawings. We'll also be giving out an Amazon $500 gift card after every presenter 
on today's event. What an incredible lineup of prizes. Now, to be eligible for today's prize drawings, you must be present on the live event. We do the drawings multiple times throughout the event. Winners have the option to make a donation to a selected charity. Grand prize winners must submit an IRS Form W-9 to Actual Tech Media. We will reach out to prize winners via email after the event. And the full prize terms and conditions can be found on our website, as well as on the Handouts tab right there in your web browser. If you click on Handouts and scroll to the bottom, that's where you'll find the Terms and Conditions link. Now, through the Megacast and Ecocast event series, thanks to generous prize winners, we have given out thousands of dollars to the selected charities that you see on the screen here. So if you win one of these prizes and you'd like to donate the prize value to charity, we can donate that prize value in your name to one of the selected charities. So thank you in advance if you should choose to do that. Now, I said we want this to be a social event. The hashtag for today's event is DP Megacast for Data Protection Megacast. I'll be following that hashtag on Twitter. I am David M. Davis. You can follow me and also follow Actual Tech Media. If you'd like to keep up to date on the latest and greatest in enterprise tech, you can follow Actual Tech Media on our YouTube channel, our Facebook page, as well as our 10 on Tech podcast over in the iTunes store. So make sure that you check those out. And now let's kick off today's event with our keynote presenter. I'm excited to be joined by Mr. David Chapa, Senior Analyst and Co-Founder at the CTE Group. David, how you doing? I'm doing well. How are you? Doing great. Thanks for being on the event today. Um, I met you at a, a big data protection convention and you know I, I learned all about your experience in disaster recovery and, and what you do now. Um, for those of you and for those who don't know you in the audience, let's just start off with, you know, what do you do at the CTE Group? Sure. So the CTE Group, the organization really is, um, it's a hybrid organization. So we do traditional analyst work. So we work with manufacturers in data protection, disaster recovery, business continuity, as well as data storage. Uh, but then we also work with the end user customers who are uh, looking for insights into uh, data protection platforms, uh, into some ideas around disaster recovery and just kind of, you know, giving customers a little bit of uh, a little bit more uh, kind of wood behind the arrow when they're looking at building out their long term strategies uh, for their own environments. Okay, so you go into companies, I assume large and small and, and help them with their disaster recovery planning. Is that kind of what I'm getting? Yeah, we help them with their planning. Um, we can go in there and have a full team. And we could probably, I mean, we can usually knock it out within a day, uh, go through a full DR planning and then hand over uh, a document to the customer. So it's a, it's a pretty intense, um, intense and condensed um, DR planning session. And uh, what I like about the way that we do it, it's different than I, I've been doing in the past. This is a shift for me is it's really about focusing on the mission of the organization. So, you know, for too long, um, the, old, the old way of doing things was to let's run a business impact analysis, which I still believe is important to do, but let's, let's do a business impact analysis in every single business unit, understand what the cost is if we don't have that business unit, and then let's roll that into our what if scenarios and let's build our plan. And that is very time consuming. But when you kind of just simple it, uh, simplify it, get down to the basics and say, okay, what's the mission of the business? If you're an airline, uh, the mission for your business is to keep airplanes safely in the air and then safely landing on the ground and transporting your, your uh, passengers and your cargo. So let's focus on, on those things. So what happens if? So then we kind of skip all over the, the business impact analysis. And we go right to the mission because quite candidly, if you're not getting planes in the air, it doesn't matter what business impact analysis result says how much you'll be losing an hour, you know you won't be making money if you can't get planes in the air. So we just we focus on the mission of the organization, um, and I think it really does streamline the whole process in getting to a, a solid DRBC plan. Smart. Yeah, I like that. So, I mean, you've been in the industry a long time, you know, 30 years, I, I saw in your bio. Um, how have things changed in data protection and disaster recovery? So, you know, I have been in there for a long time, and it's changed, but yet it hasn't changed. So there's a lot of the things that we're doing today that we've been doing for a long time. You know, we still do a lot of batch style data protection. You know, we wait to a certain, certain hour of the day and we, we back everything up and, and then we, 
you know, either back up to desk, or back up to cloud, or back up to some other medium. But where we have to see this progression is, you know, we're doing a lot more hot backups, live backups. Um, but we're still kind of stuck in the kind of the grandfather, father, son, you know, the, the old ways of doing things. I used to sling, you know, 288 meg disk packs um, that I would spin up and, and back up data to. We're not doing that today. Hopefully no one's doing that today. <laughs> but we're still doing, you know, that kind of backup. We're doing a batch backup. It starts here, ends here. And oh, by the way, during that, that, that time between the end of backup and the start of the next day's backup, we have a thing that I call exposure. Uh, customers are exposed if there's a disaster, if there's a problem, if there's corruption, they're exposed because they've got to go back to last night's backup, which, which can cost some money. So I, we've, we've changed a bit. I, we're, I still see a lot of customers still in that same kind of mode of, of backup operation. Okay. And when you get started, you know, talking with customers, I know you said you start with the, the end in mind and, and the company's business, um, you know, what they need to do to be successful in their business and how to you know, protect that. Um, I'm curious, what are some of the common pitfalls that you see in the process? Um, well, I think some of the common pitfalls is um, when I get a customer to kind of buy into the idea of let's, let's look at where you want to end up. What's the end in mind? Um, some of the pitfalls it really gets down to uh, project management. Um, customers want to, they, they see, they see the process, they trust the process, but then management wants them to move this along a lot faster. And so they they skip some steps. They get a little bit, um, rebellious, I guess is a good word. Uh, and say, you know what? Well, we, we got to get past this. We don't necessarily need to spend all the time on, on these things. Let's just skip a, a few steps. So that's, that's one of them, right? And when you do disaster recovery, business continuity planning, it really would behoove you to not skip some of those, those important steps. Um, and then also to communicate to your management the importance of taking the steps, why we're doing this. So I try to help customers that I talk to have a, uh, a good style of communication line to their management so that they can let them know the reasons why we're doing it, um, the importance to our overall mission as an as a organization, and what the end result's gonna look like. So. Um, I think skipping some steps is some of the common pitfalls. I think the other things too is um, um, trying to create one, one solution or one DR plan for everything. And we shouldn't be doing that. Um, we should be talking with all the business unit managers and finding out what do we do day to day to keep the business running. And which one of those are, are critical, absolutely critical, that we have to have up first. So if we have 18 business units and we're going to declare a disaster, do we need to have all 18 up within two hours, three hours, four hours, six hours? What are the most critical ones? And I think that's, those are some of the common pitfalls as well, is just not having that, that level of communication. You know, for a long time, IT has never been at the table making, helping to make the business decisions. But I think it's, it's shifted quite a bit. That's some of the change that I've seen as well. IT is getting more of an opportunity to have a seat at the table. And I think it's our, our job in IT to really um, ask those hard questions and not be afraid to be, you know, kind of pressing at the bull a little bit. Uh, right. So those are the things that I see that really, I think, can, can cause some grief for customers. Yeah, yeah. I, I can totally see that. I mean, when I was an IT manager, the biggest challenge with DR was that the applications and infrastructure were changing faster than we could, you know, adapt our DR plan. So the DR plan was always wrong, constantly wrong. Um, so I know we're running out of time in our little chat here. A few other quick questions. Um, today, we're going to hear a lot about disaster recovery as a service. I want to get your take on DR as a service. So I like DR as a service. I think it's a great idea, great concept. There's a number of companies I worked for in the past that, that uh, delivered DR as a service. But I think the thing that customers need to keep in mind is you know, DR as a service is gonna be disaster recovery in the cloud somewhere. Some service is gonna be offered up to you. And so you gotta think about network, you gotta think about the uh, Just like I talked about before, what's the most important systems that we need to recover? And then make sure that you can get all that data to that that disaster recovery 
uh, cloud site, wherever it's going to be, so that when you do declare, you can spin everything up with all the most recent data. So uh, network is very, very important, making sure you can move the amount of data that you need to move. And oh, by the way, you know, for customers that are listening to this, if, if a service provider can seed your data, so now you're just sending incremental changes, that's something to look at. That's a, that's a, that's a great way to get, get around the whole network challenge and then they're just incrementally updating. Uh, but I like DR as a service, um, but I think you gotta really watch out and make sure that the data that you want will be there when you need to declare a disaster and then flip the switch. Okay, okay, great advice. And if people wanna get in touch with you, learn more about what you do, or maybe talk to you about your disaster recovery consulting, what should they do? So they can go to my website, uh, which is uh, www.thectegroup.net. And just so people know, the CTE stands for Chief uh, Technology Evangelist. Uh, that was one of my titles many, many years ago. And um, so I just made a company out of it. Uh, or they can email me uh, at uh, david at thectegroup.net. Um, you can find me on LinkedIn. You can find me on Twitter d at David Chapa. You can, you can find me. I'm, I'm not, I'm not, you know, I'm not hitting at all. <laughs> How can I hide in a shirt like this? <laughs> that is an awesome shirt. Uh, we don't have time to talk about your, uh, well, that'll have to be a separate interview. Uh, there you, go. I know you have an awesome band that you play yep. in. And, um, I really appreciate you being on the event today. Great information. Thank great insight. Much. Thanks, David. Thank you. You can find the full interview of David Chapa on the Actual Tech Media YouTube channel. And now it's my pleasure to introduce the first presenter on today's Data Protection Megacast event. Someone I've known for a long time, a VCDX, V expert, Mr. Chris Colati, Principal Technologist at Cohesity. Chris, are you with us? I am, David. Can you hear me all right? I can, yeah. Take it away. All right. Well, you know, it's almost like you should do those intros for all of us with like some music to it or something. I don't know. You're so good at it. Um, so I appreciate you having us on today. Uh, I think this is the second one that I've done with, with you guys. So uh, I'm going to get right into it. I actually have some demo stuff that I'm going to do today as well. Uh, so I want to make sure we get um, get rolling through some of the slides. So let me see if my, my slides are advancing. So I'm just, I'm just going to go through a quick cohesity overview and a couple new things from a data protection perspective that we announced last year that we're actually able to demo now. Actually, one was announced at uh, Microsoft Ignite. Uh, I'll skip through my, uh, my slide. I actually found a nice picture of myself for this one. So real quick, for those who are new to cohesity, so uh, we've been around uh, since 2013, founded by Mohit Aaron, who also founded Nutanix. Um, it's a really great team of folks that's uh, broad experience within Cohesity from VMware, EMC, uh, NetApp, uh, all around the industry. Uh, headquartered in San Jose, we basically uh, we just opened up a couple new floors in the building. So uh, next time you come out, David, you can check out the 17th floor. Uh, and like most people, we've got some key investors. I don't like to dwell on that stuff too much. So one thing I just want to go through as we get into a couple of the new things that I'm going to talk about is we always here at Cohesity we talk about you know the legacy data protection issues that that people see and and I don't think this is very different and it hasn't changed much since since I was an administrator but the the issues are pretty much the same right their data protection can be complex the the RPOs can be very long in some cases we can get really expensive on some of this stuff uh, when we need to upgrade or or change out. Uh, and it, in a lot of cases, none of it's really built for cloud. It, it's bolted on or it's a, an ad hoc solution or uh, it just does nothing but increase the complexity. So, you know, Cozy's entire mission is to, to really simplify some of this stuff. Um, so as we look at, you know, how we, how we see legacy data protection, you know, there's still a lot of people out there that are running uh, virtual servers, physical servers, databases, NAS, and, and they're still using traditional methods uh, through media servers with master servers and tape libraries and target storage. And I was actually, I'm doing a, a, a call tomorrow with a customer who, who still actually has tape uh, for a very specific reason, but it's, it's not uh, widely used in, an envi in his environment, but he still has to have it. Uh, and, and what we end up with is a lot of this inefficient and fragmented, you know, data protection solutions. And if we want to actually go to cloud, you know, some customers have bolted on these cloud gateways to get to Azure, AWS, and S3 and other other endpoints. 
So how do we change the game? So Cohesi really was founded on a principle of simplification, right? So we have what we call a Cohesi data platform, which some people have probably heard about. It comes in various flavors, uh, both uh, partner appliances, a Cohesi branded appliance, virtual editions, cloud editions that run in Azure, GCP, as well as AWS. I'm actually going to show two of those today. Uh, and the operating system and everything that it runs, the functionality is the same. So from a data protection perspective, we can do backup and recovery very easily through this platform. It scales as a converged uh, as a converged environment, so you can almost scale infinitely. So it, it grows as you need to without any forklift upgrades. And we can back up uh, native virtual machines. We have agents to do server physical servers, databases. We're, we're integrated into uh, some NAS appliances as well as a couple of storage appliances like Pure for native integration. And what we've actually done is we have some, uh, we have a lot of cloud integration that not only uh, can do tiering and archiving to various cloud destinations, um, but we've also got some capabilities where we can actually present ourselves as a file system for S3 endpoints or SMB or NFS directly on the platform as a, as a web scale NAS device as well. So, you know, there's a lot of capabilities within the platform. You know, we'll focus on the data protection piece today. It's, it's, it's interesting. The vision, the Cohesity vision hasn't really changed. It, it always starts with data protection. And inevitably, once somebody understands what we do from a data protection perspective, they actually start asking about all the other capabilities of the platform. Um, and we actually end up going through that quite a bit with customers. Um, the other piece to this is, you know, we do have some of these, oops, back one. We do have this capability to do remote and branch offices. Uh, we can do remote replication between platforms. We can do uh, some interesting things between platforms, even from an on-premises side up to a cloud. For example, we have a, a, an ability to do what's called cloud spin. So we can take a, a protected virtual machine from vSphere and we can spin that out to say Azure and bring it online as an Azure VM uh, directly within the appliance and the platform uh, for test and dev purposes. So Again, a ton, a ton of capability within the platform. So finally, you know, from a, a, a overview perspective, uh, you know, what Cohesity brings to the table is that converged scale out capability. You'll see the simplified management. I'm going to actually take you through some of the UIs. D David, you know, I love doing live demos. So, you know, fingers crossed, none of this stuff is recorded. Um, very fast RTOs, uh, almost near instant. Uh, some of our recovery capabilities within the within a vSphere environment is is pretty close to instant, uh, with you know anywhere from you know one to 100 virtual machines being restored at once. Uh, and when we do upgrades, we simply expand our clusters, and it's very uh, non-disruptive. Uh, so, you know, with that, let me talk a little bit about. Um, our Office 365 capabilities, and this is what I want to live demo. We've been doing a lot of this, and this was announced at uh, Ignite 2018. I'm losing track of my years. And, you know, what we found, and I'm going to actually come right out and say this, I talked to a lot of customers, and it didn't really dawn on me until customers were, were talking to me about um, Office 365, I actually was asking real customers, I said, hey, what, is, what does Microsoft actually offer for, for backup, right? I'm, I've been a Google Apps user for, forever, personally, and, and with my family. And, you know I, know, I know there's always that story around, what do you get with your SLA? And, and uh, a, a colleague of mine, who some of you may know, uh, Teresa Miller, she pulled some of this, being a, a Microsoft MVP and really deep into Exchange. She pulled just these bullet points around what she found you know, the Office 365 exchange gives you as a customer. And, you know, they do have some, they do have a litigation hold. They, they don't have a clear cut backup. Uh, there's a couple stages of trash capabilities for the user and for the admin. There's uh, a maximum of 30 day retention. It's 14 days by default, which she actually wanted to point out is, is pretty key because most people may not change the default, right? So if you delete something, you know, after 14 days, it's gone if you haven't changed it. Uh, and then there, there is some auto archiving options for admins, but really when it comes down to it, we're going to talk about specifically, you know, the backup and recovery and, and why, you know, Cohesity decided to do this natively. So to set this up for you, you know, when we do Office 365 protection, uh, it's all done via the Office 365 APIs. And I'm going to be running it from a, from a virtual edition or from a cloud edition within Azure. 
you can do this from an on-premises uh, Khaleesi data platform. It doesn't matter. The functionality is the same. I just happen to spin one up in, in Azure because it was easier. Uh, there is some considerations. We could talk for days on considerations around proximity and ingress, egress traffic, and those kinds of things that, that you may want to consider when you're, when you're pulling all of that data if you, uh, if you have a large 365 environment. Um, but the idea is to, to really give flexibility to restore, and I'm actually going to show that. I'm going to show a full mailbox restore, and I'll show uh, an individual message restore as well. Uh, and finally, you know, set it up is it's really five steps. The, the entire platform, and this is, I think, what impresses most people. I got on a call with a customer and said, hey, they want to demo three, Office 365, and I warned them. I said, it's not a long demo. It's about five minutes. And they didn't believe me, uh, and we went through the entire thing, and they just – they were – you're really impressed, and, and I think this is something that that I was impressed with when when we released this uh, last you know, end of last year. So um, we basically are going to register an Office 365 endpoint. I've already got one registered, so I can't register it again. But I'll, I'll show you the process. Talk a little bit about that. Um, we'll go through a protection policy. We'll look at the protection job, but more importantly, I want to actually show the restores because I think that you know setting up the protection job is easy, uh, but doing the restores is where we get into some of the real uh, meat of it. So. With that, I am going to hopefully share my screen. So David, please let me know if, uh, if it shows up here. I can see it. Awesome. Woo -hoo. <laughs> All right. So what I've actually done is I've logged into uh, a CE that's running in Azure. So we've actually gotten a nice, cool little domain name for, us, for John Hildebrand and I to put some of this stuff on. Uh, and you could tell real quick, you could tell this is a cloud edition because we don't, we denote it as a cloud edition. And if I actually go to my cluster set, uh, my um, platform, uh, we can actually see that it's hardware AWS. Or, uh, so this is actually running in uh, AWS. Actually, I want to be on a different one. One second. Uh, I want to be on my Azure one. I get these confused with uh, my names here. So this is the one I want. Uh, let me just log in. This is the one I was doing something on AWS earlier. Okay, so now you actually get to see it twice. So there's a, the first one was AWS. This one's actually running in Azure. Um, both are cloud editions. So what I want to show real quickly is when we actually register a protection job uh, or, or register a source for Office 365, it's really, really simple. You know, we're going to go uh, register an Office 365. And I've already done this, but it's username and password. Now, there's a blog article that I put on coeci.com that goes through a couple specific permissions in your Exchange online environment that that username has to have. You can create a new group, add those permissions to it. Uh, and this is, this is a full-on user of Exchange Office 365. And once it has the right permissions and you register it, you're actually going to see that show up as a source. So here I've actually got my uh, Cohesity tag uh, source, which is running in Office 365. Uh, and it's already been uh, set up a, with a protection job. So real quick, I'll just show that that existing protection job that uh, runs every you know couple times a day. I think we have it running every six hours. So from a cohesive perspective, protection jobs and policies are the same regardless of the source. So that also makes it easy. So if you're bagging up virtual machines or O365 or Linux uh, uh, physical machines, you pick a policy and you pick a protection job and you create a protection job. So in this case, I've got my policy as one of the stock policies, which is called Silver. If we wanted to edit that and look at it, uh, we can see that that backs up every six hours, retains for 15 days. Uh, it has some extended retention, right? That's an out-of-the-box uh, policy. So I've just applied that to this protection job. Then what we can do is if we were doing this new, we could go in and select our uh, mailboxes that we actually want to protect. Now, we've actually set this up as an auto-protect job. Uh, and then we've actually gone and, uh, and we actually want to exclude these. I don't know why those are included. But we can uh, auto-protect means we can say any new mailbox or any object, and this applies to mailboxes, virtual machines, doesn't matter what we're protecting, anything that drops into that, that auto-protected folder, start backing up those items as soon as they hit. So we've done that here just to show it, and we've actually uh, excluded a couple of these. And, you know, you can tell that we're – Marvel fans here at Cohesity, if you haven't figured out that from the names. Um, and once we add those, we can actually run the protection job. Now, this job's already run a number of times, so I, I want to jump right over to the recovery piece. If we wanted to look at these protection jobs, we could see 
you know, what was run, how much data was backed up. We can inspect each individual one and look at each mailbox that was, uh, that was backed up if one happened to fail. So to go through the recovery is actually where it's really interesting. Once we've got all this stuff backed up, what I've, what I've done is I've logged into uh, a, what we call a demo restoration mailbox. So this is a mailbox that, that we have our SEs use that, um, that where we can restore uh, objects to without logging in as the individual user, similar to the way an admin would do it. You know, XYZ person has left the company, let's restore their mailbox to a temporary location, inspect the messages, grab what we need, et cetera. Uh, so in this case, we're going to go ahead and run a new recovery job. So I'm going to run a new Office 365 job. Now, if you've never seen a Cohesi recovery, we do everything through Google-like search. So I can actually search for my name, uh, and it's going to pull up, you know, it'll find my mailbox. I can search for wildcard, and it will pull up uh, every mailbox. I could search by a protection job if I wanted to. Um, that's if we're searching by mailboxes, which is the first thing we're going to do is restore a mailbox. So what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to choose my mailbox. Uh, I'm going to hit continue, and for purposes of this, I am going to redirect this recovery to an al to this alternate location that I'm actually logged into. So I'm going to pick my uh, demo mailbox, which is my restore demo, and you'll notice it gives it a folder name, and we can edit this to anything we want. Uh, but when this is it, this is the recovery process. This is why I say to people this is fairly simple. So we're going to recover this entire mailbox and send the whole mailbox to this uh, recovery mailbox that I've set up. So once we kick that off, if we toggle over to the recovery mailbox, we can actually see that a recovery was done earlier today because we actually share this environment and we'll see mine come in. And we can actually, while that's recovering, we can see that somebody actually restored Luke Cage's mailbox. We can see the whole uh, inbox. We can see everything in the mailbox, literally the outbox, sense items, um, everything that's contained in it, which is, is why it's a full mailbox restore. So this is one way that we can grab an entire copy of a particular user's mailbox. Uh, so here's mine that's being restored as we're talking. So the, the file structure is coming in. So we have everything in that mailbox in a, in a secondary location from backup. And we could have actually picked any point in time uh, to recover this from. While that's actually going, I wanna show real quickly our, the individual messages as well. So if we wanted to just search for uh, an individual email. So let's just say I want to look at anything that has test in the message. Again, Google-like search. We can do this with the from, the to, uh, folder names. Uh, so you can see here that here's a test message that went to a bunch of different people, went to the restore, it's sitting in the restore demo. It, I sent it to Teresa. Uh, I want to actually pull the one that's out of my, my tag admin mailbox though. So I'm just going to grab this one message and I'm going to do the same exact thing. I'm going to recover it to my, my demo location. It's going to give it a new timestamp. So I'll just say message recovery so I can find it. This one will actually be pretty quick because uh, as this other mailbox is restoring, <clears throat> uh, we'll start to see that one come in. But uh, let me wait for that one to show up. And we'll see just that one message essentially uh, with it get restored. We won't see the whole mailbox itself, we won't see the whole structure. Uh, and while those are actually, oops, it's actually done, let's see if it, I have to refresh. I'll look web access is a little weird, sometimes you have to do a lot of refreshes. So here we go, here's the, the individual message, administrator, you'll notice the rest of the mailbox isn't there, just the inbox with that test message. So an individual message restore, you can direct it right back to the user's mailbox, of course. So if, the, if user A said, hey, I lost this message, can you go find it for me? Uh, we can search through all of our all the data on the platform uh, and recover it from any point in time and send it right back to their mailbox and they'll see it. The last thing I just want to touch on before I get to some questions uh, is we can actually add to the legal hold, the litigation hold capability that Microsoft has within the platform itself. So if we decided that we wanted to go look at one of these protection jobs and inspect a particular mailbox and let's say, uh, oh, Stanley's probably a bad one to use. Let's say I left the company. Uh, you'll notice I can actually just within this one snapshot run, so within this one run that was done today on February 13th, if that was the last run, I could add a legal hold to that individual run. Uh, and now nobody can delete this snapshot. It won't be deleted from the system. It'll be there forever until we release the legal hold. The other thing we can do 
is we can do that, excuse me, we can do that legal hold against uh, the whole uh, job run itself. So you'll notice this one, it has the legal hold indicator on here, but you have to dig in to see which one was held. If I wanted to hold an entire run with all the mailboxes, I simply edit that, that whole run and do the legal hold at the, at the top level. So now we would see that everybody's mailboxes in here are part of that same legal hold. So it's an additional functionality on top of the litigation hold that Office 365 might, might give you. I know there's a lot of information. David knows I like to try to stick to my 20 minutes um, so I don't run everybody else long being the first presenter. So I'll, I'll pause there and I think I'll toggle over and, and we can look at some of the, um, some of the questions here. Unless David, you yeah. have Yeah, cool, cool demo, Chris. I love seeing the live demos. Um, so much better than seeing slides to really see, see the product in action. <laughs> we, do, we do have some questions here for you. Um, first one here, is, they're asking, does Cohesity have their own backend storage? I mean, so Cohesity is secondary storage, but you might want to explain exactly what does that mean? Can I yeah. store, can I use it for my file services or what? Yeah, so, so that's a great, it's, a, it's always a good question. So Cohesity uh, is the software, right? And then we may, we do have our own appliances with the Cohesity logo on it. We partner with HP, uh, HP, Cisco, and other vendors, and they have appliances that are Cohesity certified. For those appliances to work, they're hyper-converged boxes, right? So they're CPU, they're, they're memory CPU, network, uh, compute, and disk all in one node. So, for example, a four-block C2505, which is the Cohesity uh, brand, uh, has, I forget how many hard drives are in it, but there's a mixture of SSD for metadata, and then there's a bunch of spinning disk for uh, the actual backup data, and then there's four nodes within that 2U block. So, um, just to make sure everybody's clear, is it's really about it being a, um, uh, a hyper-converged node, and then we stack on, you know, another, another four-node block, another four-node block, another four-node block. Okay. But each, so each block it, has storage, CPU, compute. It's, it's truly hyper-converged. Very nice. Okay. Uh, for those out there in the audience, I want to draw your attention to the slides window. I popped up a poll question. Would you like to be one of the first to learn more about the Cohesity solution? I'll just leave that up on the screen while we do some more Q&A here. Um, I don't know if you can answer this one exactly, but Bruno is asking, how long does it take to restore a one gig mailbox? Uh, don't know. So it's actually the, the interesting thing about the restores with Office 365 is there's a lot of the, it depends. Um, it really depends not just on the size of the mailbox, but where are we running the Cohesity data platform? Is it is it on premises? Are we pulling that data over your you know basically the internet connection from Office 365 APIs down to on premises? Are we use, doing what I'm doing with a cloud edition? Uh, and is that cloud edition you know a little bit closer in proximity? Does it have a, a, a bigger uh, internet bandwidth, um, are we pulling it down over a VPN, for example, uh, to, or, or, uh, or in the office environment, you know, do we have a, um, a direct connection uh, link? So it's a really hard question to answer because when I don't have one big enough that's got one, you know, one gig of data, we've seeded a lot of the data. Um, I wish I could give a better number, but I just think there's a lot of, a lot of ifs. There's a lot of variables to it. Sure, yeah. So maybe do a POC. And, and he could find out, right? Yeah, we've actually we've had a lot of customers test it with the on-premises appliance, a cloud edition, uh, you know, even an AWS edition, you're cross-connected. And each one kind of yields a little different result um, because they're all, you know, at the end of the day, they're pulling it from Office 365. And I couldn't tell you in the, the environment we stood up what region that Office 360 are, those mail in the O365 admin backend and find out. Uh, and then maybe deploy an appliance within the same region. I think the appliance I'm using is deployed in the central region right now. Okay. Another question here. With a slim team, how administrative, or basically how easy is it to administer Cohesity is Marco's question. Uh, it's actually really, really easy. Talk about slim teams. The, the team that I'm on it only has three people, and we manage, uh, let's see, uh, about one, two, well, I don't know. We've got 16 nodes on the truck that we manage. We've got some cloud nodes. We've got a colo set of nodes. Um, what we do is, is we didn't get into it this time. I think we showed it on the last one is we have a SaaS solution called Helios that all of your clusters can report into, and you can actually have centralized management from the Helios platform. So you 
can truly manage a lot of this stuff with a pretty slim team. Very nice. Michael's asking, can Cohesity back up SharePoint Online and OneDrive as well? That's a fluid question. It, um, uh, if we're not all under NDA. Uh, it's something we're looking at is what I can say. <laughs> okay. We started, okay. I, I'll say we started with Exchange, and now we have APIs hooked into Exchange, so there is a lot of future possibilities. Okay. Yeah, it makes sense that that might come at some point. Um, Keep your eyes peeled. Watch, watch the blog post. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, Roberto's asking, does Cohesity have a presence around the world? Yes, actually we do. We are uh, we are global. We have uh, a growing presence in APAC. Uh, we have a pretty good presence in EMEA. Uh, there is a couple, I believe there's offices in EMEA and APAC. So, yeah, we are over 900 employees uh, worldwide. So definitely not just U.S. Okay. And a question is, does Cohesity deduplicate uh, de data when backing up? Yeah, it, it's funny. I almost never talk about that because uh, I consider that these days quite a bit of table stakes. But yes, we do. So for the for an office environment, for an Office 365 environment, it's actually even more useful because uh, you know those blast email messages that have the exact same attachment and go to a thousand people. Um, that's not going to get backed up a thousand times, right? We're going to dedupe all of that. Not only the attachment, but we'll dedupe you know the messages themselves. So. We're actually seeing some really high high efficiency ratios on Office 365 customers that are POCing it and testing it right now because of that. So uh, everything else is also deduped and compressed, and uh, we do all of our compression in line. But, yeah, I, I do apologize. I kind of skipped that over because I just see that as table stakes now. <laughs> no problem. No problem. Um, I think, Chris, Chris that's all, all the time we have for our live Q&A, but there's a number of more technical questions there for you. Uh, in the queue, maybe you can get back to those folks and post the answers publicly and share them with everybody else. Yeah, absolutely. I'll stay on and, and kind of go through those. But I think those were uh, those were great questions, and uh, always love uh, being on with you, David, and uh, and doing the live demo stuff. And there's we're we're always going to have more more stuff to demo for you. So <laughs> awesome. Yeah, keep those live demos coming. We love to have them on the MegaCast. So uh, thanks for being on the event today, Chris. All right, brother. Appreciate it. For more information on Cohesity, of course, visit Cohesity.com. Also, check out the handout that's available for download right there in your audience console. Uh, it is the Cohesity uh, product spec sheet that will help you learn all about the data protection for Microsoft Office 365 that Chris uh, just demoed for you. So make sure you check that out. And with that, it's time to give out our first Amazon $500 gift card. The prize winner for this first gift card is Missy Burke of North Carolina. Congratulations to Missy. We've got a lot more prizes to give away. So if you are not named Missy Burke, stay tuned uh, because we have more drawings on the way. And with that, it's my pleasure to introduce Mr. Don Kirouac. He is a technical marketing engineer at Pure Storage. Don, are you with us? Yeah. Hey, David. How's it going? Going great. Thanks for being on the Megacast. Take it away. All right. Thanks. Uh, good morning, uh, good afternoon, uh, folks, depending on where you're joining from. Um, again, as David said, my name is Don Kerouac, and I'll be uh, taking you through um, our business continuity solution with the um, Pure uh, Flash Array. Um, we affectionately refer to this capability or this feature as Active Cluster. Um, so without uh, further ado, we'll go through. Um, again, just a disclaimer that uh, no one's going to hold me personally responsible for any of this information, but uh, that, <laughs> be that as it may. Um, so Active Cluster um, is, is really an enabling uh, capability of a, of a um, flash array. And um, by enabling, I mean because it allows you to connect two flash arrays together and then present the same storage um, out to hosts that are clustered, um, you can build um, high availability clustering both within and across data centers. Um, so some examples of what you might deploy on top of a solution like this, um, Oracle Rack, uh, a VMware, um, what VMware refers to as a v -met um, VMware Metro Storage Cluster, uh, Microsoft Hyper-V, uh, SQL, and so forth. All, anything that's, that's clustering um, that has that clustering capability to share nicely among hosts um, 
and then share backend storage can be deployed on top of this. Um, and because the solution does fail over um, automatically um, or recover from the loss of one of the two arrays automatically, um, there, the, you can build uh, solutions that really are um, zero RTO or basically recover, require no recovery. They simply continue running um, in the face of the disaster. So quite powerful um, type of a solution. Um, it is <clears throat> based on synchronous replication, so there is a, a, a li limited distance between the two flash arrays. Uh, we support up to 11 milliseconds of round-trip latency uh, with this type of a solution, which gets you anywhere between you know, 100 to maybe up to 500 uh, kilometers uh, between your data centers. So um, your mileage may vary based on your, your infrastructure. This feature also is included with the flash array, so there's no um, extra licensing, there's no um, capacity chargers, there are no appliances um, that are required for this. It's, it's simply you know, built into the purity operating system and something that, that you get when you buy uh, a flash array, so um, pretty simple. What also separates this solution is the um, Pure One Cloud Mediator. So if you think about having a two-node cluster and, and how do those nodes determine whether their peer has failed or simply disconnected, um, you need some kind of a third site, a quorum, to help you know, make that determination. For Active Cluster, we use something called the Pure One Cloud Mediator. And traditional solutions like this um, require you to have a third uh, fault domain, uh, deploy a virtual machine in your um, on your environment somewhere else that's isolated. Um, with this solution, you're actually, um, all of that's eliminated um, from your responsibility. Uh, Pure um, has created a, a mediator service that runs in, in the public cloud, one that we patch, monitor, upgrade, and maintain for you. And because it's in the cloud, it's not part of your fault domain, or hopefully it's not part of your fault domain um, for either of the other two uh, physical data centers. So. Really simple, um, again, eliminate some of the workload from your site. Now, if you're a customer that doesn't allow external connectivity um, you know, to the public cloud, then we also do have a physical, um, I'm sorry, a on-prem um, virtual machine that you can deploy in the way that I guess other solutions do it. But um, by default, and the majority of our customers um, deploy it using the cloud um, mediator solution. So really simple there. Some use cases with Active Cluster, I mentioned within data center, we're able to create um, you know, rack high availability or a, a cluster that, that uses both arrays, the, each array uh, in a different physical rack. Um, we're able to do migration between two different flash arrays, two different models. So if you had a prior generation and a new generation, we can uh, move you non-disruptively between them. Um, if you're consolidating workloads, so let's say you have several smaller flash arrays that you'd like to consolidate onto one larger one. Um, again, this type of capability um, helps there. Uh, going beyond the single data center, um, we're able to build stretched uh, metro clusters um, that, that you know, have that 11 milliseconds of round trip latency on their WAN. Um, building solutions like this enables those use cases where you talk about being able to lose a data center and, and still have your business carry on um, without disruption and handle that automatically. So that's, that's, I guess, the most popular solution that we're talking about with customers. Recently, we've added a third site asynchronous capability that uses a patent pending technology where the target orchestrates replication or it uses the active cluster arrays as the source, but only pulls data um, that's unique um, that on to the target. So it's not going to pull all the changes that are coming, only the data that it doesn't already have, and it's going to balance what it pulls across the two links that you see in the picture. So a really um, very robust solution, um, one that I'll talk about in, in a bit more detail um, in, as the slides, in the slides as we move forward. So just to kind of summarize what I've touched on so far, um, Active Cluster is symmetric inactive active, meaning that hosts can uh, write to either of the two flash arrays. The performance they receive for writes and reads will be identical. We do not have a concept of a primary and a secondary site or, or have a one that's owned by one array or the other. Uh, this is true symmetric active active. Writing can be done at either side. Performance is exactly the same. 
As I mentioned, that cloud mediator enables the transparent failover. So if one of the arrays um, is um, disrupted due to power failure or perhaps your WAN connection is, has gone down, um, we can transparently fail over to one of the two arrays. Um, and I won't touch on the other ones that I kind of mentioned with the licensing, um, just to, to kind of in the interest of time. From a requirements perspective, um, obviously you do need two flash arrays, um, otherwise it's, it's not going to be very highly available against that loss of an array. Um, to get this capability, uh, as mentioned, it's, it's part of the operating system, so once you upgrade to Purity 5 or higher, um, you have this capability. Um, nothing else to do there. Um, today we support um, 10 gigabit Ethernet connectivity for replication. Um, so between your data centers, we'll use anything, you know, from an Ethernet perspective that you have. Our interfaces are 10 gig. There are two per controller, four total per flash array. Um, and those will be kind of uh, establish a mesh um, connectivity model between the two flash arrays to make it as resilient as possible. Let's talk a little bit more about the transparent failover and how that works. Um, I mentioned the cloud one. I'm sorry, the Pure One Cloud Mediator. Um, when you first um, set up Active Cluster, the um, mediator is discovered automatically. It uses a, a gateway that we've already probably installed in your environment for dial home and for remote assist. So we're, we're using a secure gateway to get out to the public. Um, Don, are you there? Yeah, hey, um, apologies. Um, I think my call dropped. Um, no worries. No worries. I'm glad you're back. Let me yeah, put you back I'm, on. I'm glad I was able to join. Where do we where do we drop off? All of a sudden, I, I fast forwarded a whole bunch of uh, slides. Um, there we go. Perfect. Thank you. Yeah. Go ahead. All right. And um, again, apologies, folks. Um, so let me continue uh, before where I left off. Um, another concept that's important with Active Cluster is the um, pod concept. And um, a pod is is just a logical container that that will put volumes into. Uh, that we wish to stretch between the uh, the two flash arrays. Um, we're also able to control um, through preference which array will continue servicing I/O for these arrays um, in the event that one of the others is lost. So um, these pods, you know, control the I/O behavior and they are a way to group logically uh, LUNs that you wish to stretch. Um, I'll go more into the preferences in a moment. Um, so just a quick. Um, illustration of how our um, cloud mediator plays a role. So if I've stretched volumes A, B, and C between the, the uh, two flash arrays shown, and then I lose the connection between them, uh, from the management interface on both flash arrays, um, we do a race out to the Pure One uh, cloud mediator. And then um, depending on who arrives first, um, that flash array will receive um, the notification that it's won the mediation race. And it will keep the volumes online. So you'll see on the left, uh, volumes A, B, and C will be continuing um, service on the left flash array because that was the winner. Um, <clears throat> any um, connectivity to the second array for stretch volumes is um, suspended. So there's no chance of having a split brain with this type of solution. And as soon as the um, mediation race occurs, all I.O. is paused until there is a winner. I mentioned the ability to control uh, which flash array keeps volumes online. That's important when you have um, uniform host connectivity where one host is only connected to one flash array. Um, if you have a specific workload that's, say, running in site A, in our example here, uh, site A has three virtual machines that reside on uh, volume A, which we, maybe we'll call that data store A. And then the um, pod below it um, with volume B, we'll call that data store B, and that corresponds with the virtual machines. It's, it's the backing data store for the virtual machines at site B. In this case, um, we've indicated a preference for um, A to keep running at site A and um, B to keep running um, and being serviced at site B. So when the mediation race happens for each of these pods, we're able to control which Flash array keeps them on on site. Uh, excuse me, online with with these preferences. So, um, in this case, the first um, pod race was won by uh, site A, the second by site B, and in doing so with uniform host connectivity, now these virtual machines are are not disrupted. Um, if you had uniform host connectivity, um, 
it probably you know wouldn't have been as critical to have this. Although, if you have sites that are uh, separated by a great distance and the host now have to cross a WAN to get to storage, that definitely could impact performance. So these failover preference are important in, in both cases, but in the um, non-uniform um, use case, um, it's, it's, it's doubly important just because now the VMs wouldn't have to be uh, restarted um, if you had uh, VMHA um, protecting, VM or HA protecting them. All right, so I'm gonna move on now to the new feature that we've uh, introduced recently, Active Active Async. This is the three site with an out of region leg um, solution. So it, it obviously uses the uh, active cluster solution I've mentioned, but now um, it allows a connection off to a third site um, that is going to intelligently pull data from flash array one and two. So flash array three in this example has a uh, network connection to array one and to array two, and it's pulling data um, based on what it already has. So if there's content that's being created and sent in the form of a snapshot to array three, array three is only gonna take that portion of that content that, that it doesn't already have, and, and in doing so, saving bandwidth and saving time uh, in terms of how quickly it's able to pull the data to that third site. Also what's nice about this solution is if flash array one or two is lost, uh, flash array three, the target, can still continue without disruption and without rebaselining um, the data it already has. Your RPO is preserved through the loss of an array, a data center, um, and also when that array or data center is brought back online, it's non-disruptively and automatically rejoined um, to flash array three, and flash array three will again begin pulling data from flash array one or two, depending on which one is um, giving it the best um, performance and turnaround on its request. But in effect, the third array, the target, is load balancing um, the, those two links that you see um, and using both of them um, based on how much bandwidth is there, what the latency is like, and so forth, and getting the best use out of, out of either of them. So uh, really a um, kind of a next level type of out of region protection um, in for, for business continuity. Okay, so uh, just a real quick recap on the active active async. Um, it is um, based on a patent pending um, target orchestrated technology. And again, the, the key here is because the target has visibility into both of the source arrays, it, it's able to pull things um, from both and if one goes away, it can continue using the other. It can also automatically recover um, without any administrative intervention. Um, if one of the um, arrays you know, is lost and then comes back, not a problem. Your RPO is still protected. Your out of region copy is still there. Um, no need to rebaseline. Again, if, if one of the two um, active cluster arrays fail, um, you don't need to start uh, resyncing from the survivor. The one that remains online just continues where it left off. No need to be baseline at all. I mentioned the automatic parts of this. Um, in terms of how far that, that target array can be, it can virtually be anywhere on the planet. Um, you know, we'll, we'll be able to put it um, you know, anywhere within uh, you know, uh, a few seconds of latency, so thousands of milliseconds potentially away. Um, this feature also is part of purity, so there are no licensing um, requirements for this no appliances to buy. Um, this is all part of the solution. When you purchase an array that's running um, Purity 5.2, um, you get this capability, so, so pretty simple. All of this functionality is managed from the um, array GUI, so from either of the two source flash arrays. Um, you can manage this entire solution uh, through one interface, um, again, making it very easy to administer and to monitor. quick um, illustration of how it would work. Um, you can start off with one flash array doing asynchronous uh, replication. You'll put the volume you're protected inside of what we call a protection group. Um, you can then connect a second array, build on active cluster, keeping that protection group um, in place. And now at this point, both of those um, arrays at the bottom left are, push, are, are having data that's pulled um, to that async DR target. We can um, 
pull portions of what's in volume A or what's inside that protection group from either, uh, either of the two arrays. If one fails, the surviving array continues sending uh, snapshots based on the replication schedule that you set. When the uh, array that failed comes back online, um, the system automatically puts um, the connection back and begins using that again, all without administrative intervention. If you have a, a network connection such that one array has higher bandwidth than the other, um, the target is smart enough to use the um, higher bandwidth link more, and it will, um, again, send requests for content to the array that's getting things done the quickest. So if that's a lower latency, higher bandwidth, or maybe one of the two flash arrays is less busy than the other, that one will get the majority of the work, whereas the one that's busy or has the low bandwidth or a high latency link, that will get less of the content that's being requested. So um, requirements around this solution, we do require um, the target to be connected to both uh, of the two source arrays for obvious reasons. It, it wouldn't fail over very well if we only were connected to one. Um, so there are um, you know, connections required to both. Um, and you do need the replication interfaces on both source arrays to be able to get to that async network. Um, so you'd need some routing in place if, if you hadn't had it previously. And then obviously you need a third flash array for an async target. So um, pretty, pretty obvious um, based on what we've described so far. So um, just to kind of tie things off, um, active cluster um, compared to other solutions out there, it's true symmetric active active. We don't have one ownership or the concept of a, um, you know, one controller owns the one, the other has to defer to it. Um, both sides are active active. Um, from a setup perspective, uh, active cluster can be set up um, in, in a matter of minutes. It's, it's literally four commands um, to, to set up active cluster, so very quick. Um, you, as you saw, we have multiple use cases where you know, in data center, across two data centers, or even out of region to a third. Um, comparatively, um, other solutions may cost hundreds of thousands of dollars to um, deploy, require professional services. Um, ours, ours is all included with the uh, purchase of a flash array. So, so really some, some big differentiators around active cluster compared to what you might have seen in the past uh, for business continuity. So uh, David, that kind of ends the presentation portion if we wanted to um, you know, go over to maybe answering some live questions. Absolutely, yeah, great presentation. Uh, Don, while we do some live q and I'm gonna pop up this poll question for the audience. Uh, it says, would you like to be one of the first to learn more about the pure storage solution uh, that Don just presented to us? Um, and so while we do that, let's see, a question came in, is there an option for encrypting the, tra the traffic in transit and at rest? And also what about compression? A, a multi-part question, Don. Sure, so um, from a um, data at rest encryption perspective, Every flash array um, has data at rest encryption turned on all the time. It's, it's really not an option, it's, it's simply there. Um, as far as encryption for data in flight, um, that's something where um, a third you know, party solution would, would need to be introduced. Um, we don't natively do that today. Um, and then, uh, I'm sorry, the third part of the question was? Um, Com compression. compression. So compression, right. So, for the synchronous portion of the, um, the, the transfer, so for active cluster, um, if you think about things in terms of we want to return an acknowledgement to the host as quickly as possible. For the synchronous portion of the I.O., we're not doing um, any compression or pattern recognition at all. We're simply taking the data, sending it to the, to the target or the peer active cluster array, and then acknowledging it back to the host. And that's all done in the interest of best possible performance, lowest possible write latency. Um, given your WAN. Um, once that's complete um, and, and outside of the host IO path, we definitely are doing data reduction, both compression and deduplication before data is, um, you know, finally um, hitting those data at, at rest encrypted all flash drives. Um, for the async portion, um, we are only pulling unique content, so things are deduped. And in some cases, uh, again, if the target already has the content, we're not even going to pull it across because, um, you know, the target has the best view of what data it needs relative to what's being sent. So um, we do have some, um, you know, uh, data reduction happening uh, going off to that third site. Okay. And then 
what about the the maximum distance to be for an active active you know cluster to to work? Uh, how do you figure that out, or what's the number there? Sure. So. Um, it's 11 milliseconds um, round trip WAN latency. And, and the reason we can't give um, a, a hard number on that is because the, the infrastructure, the, the, the telco providers that you may work with, or maybe you own your own fiber between your data centers, um, each of those um, links will have slightly different um, paths that they travel, se se uh, separate um, latency characteristics that we, we really can't predict. So for us, we'll say 11 milliseconds gets you in the ballpark of um, anywhere between 200 and say 500 kilometers, you know, 250 miles, um, you know, under under what I would say normal conditions are. But um, you know, you might have much better um, success with your WAN provider um, if you own the lines. Obviously, that's going to give you, and you have a straight shot between two data centers. That's going to give you the the maximum distance. Okay. And then, what about applications? I mean, will this work for any application, or are there certain application requirements? Uh, sure. So I, the way I like to say it is um, any application that can take advantage of shared storage. So think of anything that you can run on a single array that allows multiple hosts to access the same LUN, that type of a solution can also run um, with active cluster. Um, the only other caveat I would, I would add is that uh, with clustering solutions like Oracle Rack, each of the nodes in the Oracle Rack cluster um, are also connected over a, um, what they call a, um, one of the cache fusion layer that's over a 10 gigabit Ethernet network. So for a um, specific host architecture that also maintains cache across nodes, um, the, um, the hardware vendor, in this case Oracle, they'll have their own set of distance limitations. Um, you know, they may not support 11 milliseconds. They may only support one. But from a storage perspective, you know, we're obviously going to work with whatever Oracle says they will, um, you know, support and maintain. Um, but yeah, that's that's about it on that one. Okay, all right, very cool. Well, this is a I would consider it the, like the ultimate, you know, in high availability and data protection. So, a uh, really cool presentation. Uh, that's all the time we have for the live questions, Don. But there's some more technical questions there for you in the queue. Thank you for being on the event today. All right, thank you very much, David. Always a pleasure. For more information on Pure Storage, visit their website, purestorage.com. Also check out the handout that's available for download there in your console. And now it's time to give out uh, another Amazon $500 gift card. That gift card is going out to uh, Dusand Rotarov from Michigan. Forgive me if I messed up your name there. Uh, Dusand Rotarov, I will post the name uh, of that winner as well as the uh, previous winner in the chat box. Uh, stay tuned for more prizes because after our next presenter, we'll be giving out our first grand prize and another Amazon $500 gift card. And with that, it's my pleasure to introduce Mr. Jason Clark, Senior Solutions Architect at ILAM, at ILAND. Uh, Jason, are you with us? I am, thank you, David. Pleasure being here. Thanks for being on, Jason, take it away. Absolutely. Uh, so roll right into it. So again, thank you to Megacast and, and, and David for the introduction there. Um, another thank you certainly goes to Veeam, not only for our tech partnership over the years, but for this uh, particular webinar um, from a co-sponsorship co aspect. So they're going to play a pivotal part in what I'm going to be talking about today, which is data resiliency done simply. Easy enough to say, easy enough to type into a presentation, harder uh, to execute. Uh, so we want to talk about um, as a service offerings around how you can alleviate some of the pains that come with setting this up yourself, uh, owning, managing, operating it. Uh, so we want to talk about data resiliency strategies around as a service and uh, potentially partnering with uh, a uh, CSP around getting uh, data resiliency and making it simple. So I've already been introduced, but here is uh, my face, in case you're interested, anyway, Senior Solutions Architect at ILAND. I've uh, been with the company for a little bit over four years. So happy to get into this with you in terms of uh, looking towards business continuity and disaster recovery and making sure that uh, due to high expectations within the industry is having a solution that's seamless to implement, painless to manage, and effortless to consume. Um, so again, with in today's day and age, we're, we're, we're really demanding in IT industries and, and, and decision makers uh, at organi organizations across the globe are dictating that we do more with less. Um, 
So ILAND is, is certainly in a position to be able to offer that. Um, but from a higher level, I want to start to talk a little bit about what's at risk here. And it's more than just application downtime. And I want to pause for just a second on this stat right here, which kind of blew me away. 90% of all organizations are falling short of their sort of uh, the demands necessary for meeting IT resiliency. And being in this space for as long as I have, that, that number still shocks me. Um, you know, ILAND is, is poised to be able to deliver that, and we have conversations day in and day out, but still I would have assumed that that number was going to be a little less. Um, the next stat, 50% of all organizations would not be able to survive a significant IT outage in the event of some sort of disaster, be it man-made, be it, uh, you know, some sort of natural disaster or, or some sort of attack from, in terms of ransomware. And then here are just a few consequences of what would happen to, an in, uh, to, a, to a business um, if those disruptions were to occur. The top few are talking a little bit about employee impact, be it overtime, uh, be it lo loss of uh, productivity, what have you. And then some of the other ones are, are certainly uh, pay, pay, uh, play into this as well, loss of revenue, uh, unrecoverable data, et cetera. And that's what we're going to be talking about today. And then some of the, the, the lesser known or lesser thought about impacts would be things like um, company reputation, uh, be it minor or major hits to that, and the potential for permanent loss of customers, which is, of course, going to relate to loss, in, uh, loss of revenue. So you'll often go through exercises in terms of ROI and saying, you know what, if we were to build this out ourselves versus going with an as-a-service model, you know, how much were you going to save? And what are the impacts? You know, is there a dollar value associated to downtime with, within my business? And for, for everyone out there, the answer is going to be yes to that question. And just understanding, you know, you know how that might impact your business specifically. Um, so uh, why as a service? And this says why disaster recovery as a service, but this certainly uh, plays into backup as a service as well. Um, and the first thing I want to talk about is the reduction in cost. Uh, industries across uh, that, that span multiple industries, businesses that span multiple industries are trying to get away from a capital expense model and shift over to an operational expense model. So going with an as-a-service as platform certainly reduces those uh, costs, moving those, uh, shifting those expenses into that operational model. Um, and those are things around, you know, building out and maintaining a second data center. We're, none of us are in the data center business. I would imagine that all of you on the, on the webinar today are here watching this because you're not in the data center racking and stacking, managing cables and, and doing all that and all the headaches and costs that, that come with managing and owning and operating your own secondary data center. Um, increased confidence. Uh, so we want to be make sure that you can reduce your risks uh, and then have the confidence from a security and compliance perspective that where your data resides and your access to that data is secure and fully available. Because let's face it, we want your business to, to work smarter. From an IT perspective, of course, if there are, uh, you know, uh, tasks on your plate in terms of getting to the point where you're not in that 90% and you do have data resiliency planned into your, your overall IT initiatives, then you can shift focus to more revenue generating operations um, and kind of work smarter within your organization. That's going to be key here. All right, what should you look for in a provider? Um, these are going to be some common characteristics as you're kind of uh, navigating the landscape. Uh, make sure that you pay particular respect to a few of these things here. So make sure that you have global access to your data. So look for a, a global footprint, be it in certain geos within the United States, covering a wide range of the power grids within the United States, as an example. But then also look internationally, too, if you have a presence there and need a you know, close proximity from a latency standpoint to achieve the needs um, in that global manner. Um, and then make sure the company you're working with has a financially backed SLA with a 100% uptime. Uh, because let's face it, the reason you're going to have disaster recovery or backup as a service is you're going to need easy, always available access to that data. Um, and then take a look at their technology stack, uh, things that might be important to you, a VMware-powered stack, uh, maybe even Cisco on the, on the compute side and from the networking side. And then the leveraging technologies like Veeam to be able to move your data from point A to, a to, from point a to point B and handle the orchestration and be able to plug into a, a um, enterprise class infrastructure um, uh, on the DR side. That's going to be important to look at. And then, you know, having data over there with no visibility and no manageability would be terrible. Make sure 
that the provider you're looking at, looking at has a management console fully integrated into their whole suite of products so that you can gain the visibility and the comfort level and, again, the simplicity as we're talking about today to be able to manage it and easily consume that data and, and manage your applications and data workflows. Um, take a look at their compliance posture. Uh, most of you probably uh, work out of uh, compliance regulated industries, be it HIPAA, be it PCI, or maybe you, uh, you operate independent, uh, internationally and you have to adhere to GDPR. Take a look at the uh, security that are integrated into the platform you're, you're looking to, uh, to, to uh, look, looking to adopt and then just make sure that they have the compliance regulations met and can fully report on that. And then the last thing, uh, make sure you're working with that provider in, in a consultative manner. Make sure they're listening to your unique, your, your unique use case, can adhere to that, can facilitate and put together a solution that's going to you know, mitigate your risk, uh, that the open communication is there, they're able to support it, and they have the services around uh, in a 24 by 7 manner to be able to uh, meet those demands for the course of your engagement with that provider. All right, so the framework for that success is certainly gonna come with the initial guidance uh, during the uh, pre-sales engagement, just to make sure that capturing what, what you may or may not need from a scope perspective, uh, make sure that they're putting uh, an architectural design together that meets those needs, and then they can actually integrate that and can execute upon that design. Um, making sure that there's a consultative approach to how they put the solution together. Um, there's going to be unique nuances to each and every one of the situations from a backup and disaster recovery perspective. Make sure that you gain the guidance and the operational planning around that. And then next, it needs to be something that works. That's uh, quite simple, but make sure that the solution they're offering is validated. Uh, make sure it's been tested. Make sure that you test often once you have that solution up and ready to go. It's uh, it's one thing to say, yes, I have this DR as a service offering, or I have my data backed up to another location. Test it and test it frequently. Um, there, are, I, I hear it way too many times that, that folks just have maybe have DR in place, but, but don't test it because they're sort of scared to test it. So please validate that and just make sure it's a proven solution. And then again, 24-7, potentially uh, around the clock, around the sun model for, for support, uh, you know, and make sure that's fully integrated uh, hopefully that's coming up uh, free of charge as well. So make sure that they have support baked into it. Now what I want to talk about is a broader data protection solution, and we're able to achieve that, again, through that partnership with Veeam. So they have an all-encompassing uh, range of solutions that will cover you from A to Veeam, and I did that little play on words intentionally, uh, <laughs> foreshadowing a blog post that I'm going to be uh, writing here in the upcoming weeks. Um, anyway, so they have uh, not only backup, both local and offsite backup, le leveraging a, a, a feature within Veeam called Veeam Cloud Connect. Um, so we can do offsite backup. They also have uh, backup for physical and as well as things like Office 365. Um, so those can be part of your all encompassing data protection solution, plus their uh, data or their uh, disaster recovery solution, uh, which they have. Um, and they have a, a new integration with some of the features they've been rolling out, additional APIs, to plug into uh, management consoles. So I'm going to start touting a little bit about the iLand Secure Cloud Console, which I'll be demoing towards the end of this, uh, this webcast. Um, and the, th the three things that we wanted to adhere to um, and the pioneering tenants around the iLand Secure Cloud, uh, and it, plays, it, it, it uh, dovetails perfectly into today's talk, agility, simplicity, and control. And so that's all going to be represented as I go through that demo. But those are going to be things you're going to want to look at. And all of uh, this is built on top of uh, our Secure Cloud Platform. So this may seem a little redundant in the sense that we just talked about having access to all of those. So iLAN is certainly no uh, exception. I think we set the bar rather high in terms of having uh, an always-on, always-connected environment. Um, and then that financially backed SLA that I talked about, um, and trusted technology platform. So we are uh, VMware based with uh, nimble storage, um, and then we have Cisco for the underlying compute and networking layer. And then we rely on, again, uh, technology partners like Veeam uh, for full integration from a backup and disaster recovery standpoint. Uh, and then we have that simplified management experience. I'll be demoing that here shortly. Um, and then the built-in security and compliance should, again, you be in that regulated industry and need to report on your uh, environment from a security perspective. 
And then those onboarding, both pre-sales, uh, onboarding, and then post-sales uh, support uh, around the clock uh, at, at, no, at no cost. So it's kind of all built into this cloud platform, again, intended for that resilient business. Uh, so again, this is all baked on top of the Island Secure Cloud. So this woman looks super, super, super excited to take a look at the Island Secure Cloud, uh, the console that is. So um, what I have here are a few screenshots. Um, I was sort of uh, instructed by marketing to try to do screenshots versus a live demo. But if you engage with Highland and you do go through this consultative approach, we'd more than happy uh, and we're more than willing to kind of go through a live demo. But for purposes of uh, technology, I chose to just do some screenshots here. But this is really indicative of what you're going to see in the Island Management Console. The level set, what you're looking at, I'm just accessing this Island Cloud Console via my web browser. Uh, we also have an iAndroid and iOS version of this. So think anywhere you are with any type of connectivity, you'll have access to this management console. And this management console is really just a, a set of APIs that uh, have programmatic access to all the tools that you'll need to be able to manage the environment, both pre-failover or pre-backup. And then if you were to fail over into the island cloud environment, how to be able to manage those workloads, gaining visibility into performance, uh, performing tasks upon that, you know, there are some providers that are good at moving data from point A to point B, but then you lack that visibility and the connectivity and, and, and predefined networks, et cetera, which I'm going to be going into. So you're going to want to be able to manage that from a single management console. And if you were to leverage any of the island solutions, be it backup, be it object storage, be it, you know, identity and access management, be it the overall cloud console here, it's fully integrated into this console. So the first tab I want to talk about here is the continuity tab. So this is a direct integration with Veeam so that you can um, gain another place to manage your failover plans. So your failover plans would be listed here uh, as recovery groups. And to us um, as developers, really that's just an object. So a failover plan translates to a recovery group within our environment. Then we have the ability to go over here and click, and I'm going to make it appear as if I click that button by magic. There's another screenshot. <laughs> so the failover wizard here. Uh, this is your ability to execute uh, live or test failures directly from our console. So there could be, and there more than likely during a live failover event, you will not have access to your Veeam user interface. Therefore, you can come to the ILAN Cloud Console to manage your DR environment and to execute upon a failover. So you could use this for either test or live failovers. Um, let's just say you were doing a test and you wanted to execute either an individual application or you wanted to execute a higher level entity. So that's why we built the idea and, and, and uh, developed an idea around creating a disaster recovery runbook. No one else in the industry has this. This is a uh, island um, uh, feature that we built on top of Veeam. So you can take all your failover plans and create those into larger entities. And the goal here is again to be able to get to a point where you have set it and forget it, you have confidence in your DR um, strategy so that potentially you can take those run books and orchestrate and schedule the failover tests to, to be run automatically. Maybe you're an organization that wants to take that hands-off approach and just know that it's working so again you can work smarter within your organization. So these tests will run in the background, it'll generate a report speaking to the security, uh, speaking to the uh, success of that DR test the fact that it's been proven, you have this report, it'll even show boot login screens um, showing that all the VMs have posted within the environment. So that's, that, um, that's the disaster recovery runbook and all the orchestration around that. Again, happy to demonstrate this uh, for anyone if you want more information. Um, and again, I talked about moving data from point A to point B, but that data would be worthless if there was no uh, notion of the internal, network, uh, internal networks and the connectivity to the environment. So we have, and you can sort of see this, there are two edge devices set up within, the, within this environment. So as a sort of default, um, and, and if we were live in the room together, I would have used air quotes around default. There is no default solution at iLand. Each solution is custom to meet the use case of, of each individual opportunity. So while we have you know, best practices around how we'll deploy this, there is a lot of flexibility. Flexibility extending at the physical data center location, being carrier neutral. So think, I can bring in a direct connection. I can extend a leg of my MPLS into the environment. I can set up uh, and bring my own firewall if I need to, either physical or virtual. 
So while we will dictate, or we will dictate, that sounds horrible, I just said there's flexibility, uh, we will say, we will define two different edge devices here, one for replication and testing, so that you have an isolated environment to be able to uh, test, which is non-disruptive to production. And then you have an edge device sitting out in front of that, that could be of your choosing, which uh, could be uh, provided by Island, a VMware NSX edge firewall, or maybe even a Cisco device, since we're a Cisco powered cloud. Or you could bring your own Palo Alto, your own Fortinet. Regardless, a lot of flexibility, but you have the ability to, to manage the networking directly from within the console. All right, I'm gonna switch back over to the dashboard. Uh, the dashboard within our cloud console is the hierarchical view into your virtual environment. We did it this way to emulate what it would be like to have vCenter access on a multi-tenant platform. So you'll be able to drill into the virtual data center, then into the virtual application, which is what I'm sort of showing here. It's an application called SA Desktops. Um, and then all the way into the individual VMs themselves. So here you'll be able to manage all the power management capabilities, all the secondary actions that you might need to perform. Plus you can see here charts and graphs that are fully manipulatable and, and, and you can zoom into it, you can download the data, et cetera. You can toggle between various metrics, be it CPU, RAM, storage, performance, et cetera. All of that data is being displayed in real time with access to historical information as well. Um, so we also built a, a, another level on top of that. As if the, the visibility into the performance was enough, we said, you know what? We wanna take a hands-off approach. Let's add some resource alerts to this so that we can have the software acting as another set of eyes on performance. So in this case, you could maybe set a CPU usage alert at 95% for 10 minutes, that if this were to occur, you would be notified and could potentially scale out the resources on that particular application. All right, and then at the VM level itself, um, in production, you're gonna have backup. Maybe it's with Veeam, maybe it's not. Uh, but if you were to have live workloads running at iLand, we wouldn't expect you, especially in a DR sense, to bring over your backup solution. So we have Veeam integrated on the, on the back end. Every VM that you have running live at iLand can be backed up via Veeam uh, based on your retention needs and restored at the click of a button. So just know uh, that for all of our solutions, your, your virtual machines are gonna be backed up as well. Um, and then last uh, is uh, security and compliance. We talked about this, um, but we built a uh, framework around security and compliance. We checked all the boxes, so to speak, from a security and compliance perspective, be it uh, data encryption at rest, be that nimble integration. Um, so that's encrypted at the storage array. We also have vulnerability scanning and we have a whole suite of tools via Trend Micro that you can choose to use or not use as you see fit. If you have a security posture you wanna to adhere to, by all means bring certain security uh, aspects of the solution to the table. Otherwise you can leverage the ones that we have built in. We have fully automated, uh, fully reportable uh, aspects of this, including compliance reporting should you have to go through an audit. And then last but not least, I think I said last, the last time, this is the last one, which is uh, the billing tab. So the billing tab was one of the first things we ever developed uh, for this cloud platform, because you saw the visibility into performance, because when folks were going through cloud adoption, they had fears around losing visibility into the environment, plus not understanding how much it costs. So I'd like to pick on one of the biggest behemoths in the space, I won't even mention them by name, but they'll spit, it, they'll spit out reports that are really, really hard to understand. They're 36 pages long and they're just you know, difficult to, to, to comprehend. So we built a simple billing uh, model here for you, you to be able to see in real time how the, you know, what the solution is costing. And it's especially important for backup and DRAS customers that might be failed over to our environment and wanna be able to monitor um, the, the, those costs in real time. So that at a high level were some key aspects of the uh, iLand Secure Cloud Console. Um, and then I just wanted to, 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 to round it out with um, our industry recognitions. We've been in the space for 25 years, delivering uh, disaster recovery and cloud for the past 11 to 12 years. You saw our global footprint, um, uh, 11 if not more uh, global data centers uh, spanning the globe. And then just some industry recognition from Forrester and Gartner, uh, of course being leaders in the space, we're quite proud of that. Uh, and then some of our technology uh, partners uh, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention Veeam one more time. Uh, they've, they've definitely helped us get here. Uh, we won an innovation award with a product we have called Catalyst. Uh, and then we won our, uh, their Impact Partner of the Year award. So I thought I would just end with that. Um, so I wanted to thank everyone for joining. Um, we can definitely now open it up for, for, for live Q&A. Um, and again, thank you again for your time.
Yeah, great presentation, Jason. Thank you. Uh, I do love seeing the interface. It looks very easy to use. So uh, kudos for including those and talking about those. Uh, let's see, okay. one of the questions that came in here, um, they're asking, do you have any suggestions on how to convince the legal department that DR uh, data is safe when using disaster recovery as a service? Absolutely, um, and, and convincing is one thing, and we can arm anyone with the with the information that we have. We talked about having a, a dedicated compliance team that would that would assist with that, and we can get them involved in the pre-sales process. So if that's providing documentation, if that's showing solution design diagrams or logical segmentation of data, we have a whole suite of additional and sort of pre-formatted data that we can provide that could be used as ammunition for that. We can go specifically in individual physical data center locations, put together information on the solution to kind of, again, you know, persuade the powers that be that this is in fact a secure and compliant environment. Okay, and a question here from um, Tom. He's asking, are the tools that you show part of the service or are they additional costs or how are absolutely. they? No. Yeah, absolutely, uh, no additional cost, right? So. Um, everything that you saw there from the management console comes included as part of the solution, as does the support, as does the licensing. Um, so there is no notion, um, and we've tried to keep in, in nature, and especially plays, plays well into this, um, into this uh, demonstration for today, and that is the simplicity. So even the billing mechanisms and the SKUs that we go through from a quoting perspective are really simple to understand. And there is no kind of a la carte nickel and diming involved in the solution. Everything you saw there is fully included in the solution. Okay. And uh, Don is asking, how does, does DR as a service make sense for a company with a single location? Sure. Yeah, there's, there's, there's many. We do uh, individual single locations because, again, you wouldn't want to manage a second one to achieve DR. And then we are often, we talk to large organizations, well, that have multiple sites across the globe. So this, and, and, and the beauty of, of working with someone like Island, in my opinion, is that we have deployments for very small customers, and we have deployments for very, very, very large enterprises. So we kind of span that, uh, that spectrum and can put and tailor solutions depending on size and depending on number of locations. Okay. Uh, Brian's asking, what are the typical RPOs and RTOs? Uh, that's a great question. Um, so we can meet or exceed any goals that you have. Um, we have the RTOs typically, um, and we have, and we can, uh, you know, back this with an SLA. It's typically about a minute per virtual machine, which is rather, uh, rather good. There's also some concurrency that you can get with Veeam to where it can, it can do it con concurrently. So we're really talking about an RTO of about five minutes or so with Veeam, which is phenomenal. And then you can achieve um, uh, uh, RPOs typically measured in minutes. Um, so we have uh, different technologies that we can leverage. Uh, but we're talking, uh, you know, for most customers, somewhere in the 15-minute range, um, you know, no more than uh, a couple hours typically. Um, so it depends, and there are factors that you need to consideration uh, that you need to consider, like uh, change rate of your data, uh, what what size pipe are you doing if you're doing it over the WAN, or you know, if you're doing it over uh, over the wire, uh, or if you have direct connect. There's a lot of different things that we can go through, and that's part of that consultative approach that I like to do with my team in working with you is to help you understand what you can expect to achieve within your solution offering. Okay, okay, excellent. Well, you got a comment here, excellent presentation. I think that's a good one to end on. Um, oh, great, thank you. We've got some more uh, technical questions there in the queue for you, if you don't mind getting, getting back to those. Uh, that's all the time we have for our live Q&A, but really great having you on the event today. Thank you, Jason. Sure, love to, thanks, David. For more information on the Veeam and iLand solution, check out the handout that's available there in your audience console. Um, that handout covers the essential guide to cloud-based backup and disaster recovery, and it's jointly developed by Veeam and iLand, so that's a, a great resource for you. I hope you'll check that out. If you haven't answered the poll question on the screen, now is the time to do so uh, because I am announcing our first grand prize winner. Uh, the grand prize is a brand new Mac Mini, and that is going out to Alex Bernstein from California. I also have a $500 Amazon gift card going out to Garth Hemmer from Indiana. Congratulations, Alex Bernstein and Garth Hemmer. We've got a lot more grand prizes and gift cards to give away, so make sure you stay tuned for that.
And now it's my pleasure to introduce Mr. Darren Miller, Senior Manager of Engineering, Performance, and Test at ClearSky Data. Darren, are you with us? I am. Thanks, David. Thanks for being on. Take it away. All right. Well, um, first I'll start out with a little bit of history on ClearSky. We're fairly new uh, as far as an enterprise product offering to the to the industry. Uh, we were founded in 2014, and the premise behind ClearSky Data was to offer a service that delivers uh, primary storage, integrated backup, and DR all in one service offering. Um, so we're a Metro-based service solution, and I'll get into more about what that means and when we get into the architecture and talk a little bit about how the architecture was developed and why that architecture is, is different than what most people have seen in industry today. So again, you know, ClearSky was founded on delivering an on-demand primary service, primary storage, and off-site backup uh, solution. We also have integrated disaster recovery, and the three primary offerings involve a primary storage element that I've said, and what that is is really is we offer a hybrid cloud service, and the we have an edge device that sits on-prem at a customer's site, and as data is entered into the service, uh, it gets pushed out to a backing cloud. And then we also have integrated backup and data protection within the service. We keep a single durable copy of the customer's data in the service at all times. And we'll talk more about really what that durable copy means in terms of data protection. And then we're fully VMware integrated, uh, and we have the capabilities to have uh, VMware DR as a service compute and storage integration um, on demand. So if you think of data access and being able to really access a single copy of your entire data set from you know, anywhere around the world or in the United States, that's sort of what we're talking about here with ClearSky in that we have a global data network and that data network essentially hosts the customer's copy of data. Once that copy of data is in the ClearSky service, it's really available to any of the locations that the customer has a, loca has a secondary location or a secondary office or whatever it might be. Um, we're multi-cloud support and we can also offer integration with public cloud uh, services that the customer might be interested in. From an offering, um, again, primary storage with integrated offsite backup and DR, and the backup storage with local offsite and long-term retention, retention is really our core service solution. And then as an add-on, we can offer uh, compute DR as a service uh, through third parties that we partner with. So you just saw a, you know, a great presentation from, from the folks at Island, and uh, similar to how they have the DR as a service um, offering, we can partner with someone like Island, and we also have uh, partners that we work with today to offer the similar service, we would just be the storage side of that and give a little bit of enhancements to the DR capabilities, which we'll talk about. So if you think about like a traditional data center environment and what that looks like is, you know, you have a primary storage element and this could be an enterprise array that you have in there. It could be uh, a number of different solutions that you're utilizing for your, your primary data. Uh, and then because that data is important to us, we make sure it's protected. It's either protected with an on-site protection mechanism like disk-to-disk -disk backup or, you know, backup to tape. Or there may be some integration with a cloud archive element that's involved here. But if you think about it, you know, now we're making lots of different copies of the same data set. And each of those copies is important because we need that data. And if something happened to our primary data set, we need to rely on one of those copies to recover it. 
So as you see here, you know, we end up with one, two, three, potentially four different copies of the same set of data. We're trying to get customers to think a little bit differently about how they're utilizing their data sets and move away from that multiple copy mechanism. With ClearSky, we have, as I mentioned, we have an edge cache appliance, and as the data is entered into the ClearSky service, it gets placed in a primary point of presence data center. It's sort of like a middle tier to the edge and then like the public cloud for archive. We utilize the public cloud for archive uh, for that, you know, complete durable copy of the customer's data set. But by doing it this way, uh, really we can take advantage of a number of different things. That middle tier or that primary point of presence data center, we call it the POP, uh, really gives us the advantage to do a number of different things with the customer's data. Uh, first off, we can tier the data regionally and globally. Uh, same as you would see on an enterprise class array where you have this notion of hot, warm, and cold data sets where the hottest portion of the data is placed on the fastest drives in the system, typically SSDs, or as we move into NVMe, we'll start to see that. Uh, and then the warm portion of the data is placed on high-speed spinning disks, typically. And then there's a, another portion, which we call the cold portion, which isn't accessed very often and can sit on slower disks or slower spinning disks like SATA disks, for example. And then this data is moved in and out of these tiers based on access frequency from the applications and the servers in the data center. At ClearSky, we're doing pretty much the same exact thing. But our, our algorithms are intertwined with each element of the service, the edge, that middle tier pop, and the backing cloud. So that as that data is entered into the service and then accessed by the application servers at the data center side, or the compute, that data is placed on the edge so that the edge always maintains the hottest portion of the data set. Now, the other option, uh, the other advantage that that POP gives us is we can, com we can host a complete copy of the customer's data set at the POP uh, and as well as in the backing cloud. Now, as the data set grows, We're going to get Darren back. Uh, he, he said he just lost the phone connection. We are calling back to Darren. Darren, are you back? I am. Okay, great. That might be near where you were. Is that close, Darren? You might need to go back or forward. Nope, that's fine. Back. Okay. I can get to where I was. And folks, I apologize. You know, we need we need HA and, and DR for phone conversations apparently. So <laughs> That's right. That's right. No worries. Thanks for getting back so quickly. Take it away. All right. Again, sorry about that. Um so pick up where I left off here. Um so what I was saying was, you know, with that primary point of presence data center, we can do a number of different things with the customer's data set. Uh A, it gives us the ability to offer better performance in regards to primary storage environments in that if there is a miss at the cache, uh, that miss is serviced by that POP, which it can handle in uh, round trip latency of about three to five milliseconds. Um, so that's for the primary storage element. Now, the backup element of this is really handled by that backing cloud element where we keep a complete copy of the customer's data set, both at the backing cloud and at the primary point of presence data center. That allows us to mitigate a lot of the different copies that customers would typically have in a traditional data center environment. Now, back up to tape and archive, we're handling that by essentially keeping a complete copy in the backing cloud. So you can remove or eliminate those two copies of data uh, essentially by utilizing that backing cloud for the copy and that backup. Um, from the tape backup and being able to recover data quickly, or the disk to disk backup rather, being able to recover data quickly, we can service that from the POP. 
through things like snapshots and clones of our volume sets. And essentially remove that disk to disk element or that secondary storage element of our primary data center. So now instead of having multiple copies of the same data center or the same data set within your data center environment, now you have one system and one service that's hosting a complete copy that enables both quick backup as well as archive. Now in the event that DR comes into play here, we can essentially offer that DR solution through connectivity to that Metro-based POP. And what that gives us is the ability to access that same data set simply from a different location. And that location can be either a physical location or cloud compute. Now how we do it is it's, it gets a little bit interesting here where that point of presence data center is really an access point if you think about it. And those edge cache devices are simply your gateway into that access point. Now we utilize the edge for our high speed, hottest tier of the storage. We also utilize that primary point of presence data center for a hot and a warm tier of the data. So in the event that there's a failure or you want to access the same data set from a different location, you simply move the access point from data center one to data center two. And that's your DR solution. So we don't move, actually move any data, we're just moving the access to the data. There's no replication, uh, there's no replication software involved or WAN links from data center A to data center B, uh, and none of that, all of that goes away. So a lot of that second infrastructure, like secondary data center infrastructure, now goes out the window. So we can save a tremendous amount of cost just in that alone. Now, not all customers have two physical, two physical locations, and they need a solution for DR. So this is sort of where we come into play with, uh, you could utilize the cloud if you have cloud compute, and we can spin up a cloud edge in the cloud provider of your choice, and then give that cloud edge access to that metropolitan point of presence data center similar like you would the edge cache, except the edge cache is a cloud edge. Failover is the exact same way, um, where we're just changing the access point from your physical data center environment up into that cloud provider environment. The other option is we work with uh, third party partners to host uh, like a virtual environment as your DR site. So They'll work with you as a customer to understand what the physical environment looks like at your primary data center, and then either P2V that to a physical to virtual environment, or replicate that virtual environment into their, one of their hosting data centers. They utilize our edge uh, for connectivity into the storage environment, and they'll provide a run application server side and we just provide the mechanism to uh, change the access points and the data ingest. So we can talk a little bit about what that means from uh, that aspect. That's sort of an add-on service that we have where we'll work with another third party for the compute side of things. So what have we seen from customers that are, you know, take advantage of service like this? Really, uh, the first thing that they're looking for is some sort of cost reductions, whether it's in storage, uh, whether it's in uh, elements of their data center like backup and disaster recovery, um, and, and things like that. Other thing that we're seeing a lot of uptick on is data center consolidation efforts. You know, we have a number of customers that have utilized ClearSky for their consolidation efforts because they have dispersed data centers, you know, throughout the country and it's tough and very costly for them to create these replication environments from one data center to another, to another, to another, and so on. But they need to because they need to be able to access the data that's going on at these various locations uh, for their business needs. So we just simply 
help them out by dropping in an edge cache to their loca different locations. And then as they add data into the ClearSky service, the whole data set ends up appearing in, and accessible from any of their locations anytime. So the consolidation effort is, uh, is a great story. We've seen a lot of success from customers in that aspect. Um, simply accessing data and being able to manage data simply from a single service is another reason. And um, again, the cloud adoption model that, uh, that we provide is extremely simple. Um, it gives you know, customers the confidence to start to migrate different workloads to the cloud but also have that capability of and you know assurance of data protection as well as disaster recovery integrated with the service. So again, you know, primary storage, offsite backup and DR. Uh, we provide a full lifecycle data protection and management within the cloud environment. And we provide disaster recovery through uh, our cutover mechanisms with uh, the various uh, different edge caches connecting into that single POP environment, as well as working with parties, uh, third-party providers to help us on the compute side. So from, like, from a VMware integration perspective, we have a similar boss provider that you would see typically from another vendor. It installs on your vCenter server, uh, but it takes advantage of the aspects of the ClearSky service, where if you have data stores backed by ClearSky data, you can then utilize better protection and recovery mechanisms for those data stores and the VMs hosted on those data stores. Uh, similar to what you would see from other products, we can offer a test disaster recovery or test failover and failback capability. So instead of actually walking through a full test of your disaster recovery model, uh, you can just utilize the test failover and not move any of your primary workloads, but test the operations, test bringing them back. Uh, and that's where we see uh, a lot of, I guess, happiness from customers because the failover is really the main thing people think about. If I have a disaster, I have to get my data there. I have to get my failover story correct. But what people don't think about is often and sort of leave behind is the fail back aspect of things. Okay, your workloads are now running at this other location for a number of days or weeks or months, and your primary location is backed up fully functional. I have to get all that data back, right? So the same replication models, if you're using a traditional replication mechanism, come into play here. I have to use my replication schedule. I have to move my data from point A to point B. All the diffs, sync them up on my other location, and then eventually cut back over to my primary data center. All of that thought process and sort of management headache goes away because with the ClearSky model, there's an RPO zero. All the data is in the service. So your, your recovery point is always going to be RPO zero. And then recovery time or ITO is really the amount of time it takes uh, you to bring your workloads back up in that given environment. Customer use cases, uh, I'm not going to go into a whole lot of detail here. Uh, we have a number of different customers that are in different verticals like healthcare, um, technology, technology and media, finance, uh, MSPs or managed service providers, and so on. And really, we're changing how people are thinking about the cost structure for their storage service uh, instead of thinking of in a CapEx or a capital expense sort of way, we bundle everything into a monthly cost. So it's a cost per gig, <clears throat> and this would fall more in an OPEX model, where all of those items that you would typically have to, you know, take into account for your capital expenses uh, in your data center, like storage, DR, um, WAN costs, backup, and so on, licenses and software, security, encryption software, whatever it might be, all those would be applied to that cost model from a capital expense. Every three to five years, you know, you would go through the process of, you know, a 
upgrading your software, upgrading your storage, and what, whatever it might be. With the ClearSky model, we're kind of taking that away and we're moving it more to an OPEX. We manage everything from the edge cache back. So all of the hardware, uh, any software that we're running in the back end, that's all managed through us. Uh, the customer doesn't have to manage or worry about any of that piece of infrastructure. They need to worry about really the application side and the applications that are running their business. From a storage side and all of the costs associated with uh, data protection and DR, all that's handled by ClearSky. So that model changes to an operational expense versus that capital expense. Again, why ClearSky? Uh, we have high performance, uh, hybrid cloud storage, uh, low latency from that middle tier or that regional pop location. We can support massive ingest to the cloud. Uh, we have the full cycle uh, data protection and management for cloud infrastructure. And then again, that multi-location access or being able to access that single copy of the data from any location the customer has is really key here. So folks, again, you know, I apologize for dropping off. You know, I wish I had had uh, some HA element to my phone system here, but I didn't at the time and, you know, things happen. So uh, I apologize for that, but uh, thank you for sticking around and uh, that's conclusion for what I'm presenting here for ClearSky. Yeah, great presentation. Thank you, Darren. It's a really unique solution. Uh, we do have some questions for, for you here. I'm going to pop up a full question for the audience. Uh, that is, would you like to be one of the first to learn more about the ClearSky data solution? I'll just leave that up while we do some uh, Q&A here with Darren. So, uh, Darren, uh, David is asking, would ClearSky work with like VMware's Site Recovery Manager or SRM? So, we would essentially replace uh, SRM from uh, that aspect of things. The DASA provider that we have uh, basically has the same functionality as SRM in terms of uh, being able to move your VM workloads from you know, one location to a second location, uh, being able to create that test bubble that SRM has in terms of you know, just testing the environment from one location to another location and back again without interrupting anything else. Um, so we kind of look at it as a replacement for SRM in that regard. Okay. And then Timothy's asking, where do you have, where are your POPs located? So right now we have POPs throughout the East Coast and Central United States. We're in the process of building out POP locations uh, up and down the West Coast and in the mountain region of the U.S. Okay. So uh, I think by the end of this year, just to conclude on that, by the end of this year, we should have pop locations sprinkled throughout the United States. All right. Great. Um, let's see, another question here. How does this compare to, you know, using a public cloud? How would this be different? So typically what you would see in uh, just a public cloud offering you would have uh, a gateway or an appliance that would sit on-prem uh, in your data center. And then from there, you go directly out to the public cloud provider. Um, and, you know, that alone is going to have a few different things associated with it. One, from a performance aspect, unless, you're, unless you live right next door to that public cloud provider's data center, you're going to have uh, a round-trip latency cost associated. Typically what I've seen uh, by doing some testing with the different cloud providers is it, this can range anywhere from 25 to 50 milliseconds response time round-trip. So, you know, first you're kind of dealing with that. The next thing you're going to be dealing with are uh, ingress and egress fees. And what those are is essentially when you put data into the cloud, you're charged. Now, that's the ingress fee. And ingress fees are typically a lot less than egress fees. The egress fee is when you read it back out. And, uh, you know, as, you putting data, as you're putting data in, those ingress fees will start to accumulate 
But as you're reading it out, that's where the cost really starts to blow up on you, so to speak. And it's because a lot of that read operation are, are typically, you know, can range from small reads to large reads, anything in between and so on as your applications access the data set. Now, a lot of, what a lot of solutions do to kind of mitigate those costs is they'll build out that gateway or that edge, right? So there's always some flash element to that gateway or that edge device. And typically what you'll see is uh, solutions will build that flash component uh, and increase capacity on the edge to try to mitigate some of these other costs. But by doing that, essentially what you end up is you end up having just an enterprise class all flash array at the end of the day, plus you're spending money on connectivity to the cloud provider and the additional costs of ingress and egress fees. So none of that is applied here with ClearSky. Uh, we don't charge for any ingress fees or egress fees. Uh, typically, we don't need to build out that flash or that edge element because if there's a cache miss, we can service it right from the pop uh, with very little latency. So those are probably the main differences that I would point out. Okay, okay. Well, very cool. That's all the time we have for live questions. There's some more technical questions there for you in the queue, Darren. Thank you so much for being on the event today. Thanks, David. Sorry about the phone again. <laughs> no worries, no worries. Uh, for more information on the ClearSky data solution, of course, visit their website. And if you go to the Handouts tab, actually, and click on the ClearSky data link, it will take you directly to their website, ClearSky, clearskydata.com. And now it's time to give out another grand prize. Uh, I gave out the Amazon $500 gift card. Uh, I announced that winner. That was Eric Haskett from Ohio. This prize, uh, the grand prize, is going to Justin Stolberg from Kansas. Congratulations, Justin from Kansas. You've got a lot more grand prizes and gift cards to give away, so make sure you stay tuned. And now I'm excited to introduce our next presenter on today's Data Protection Megacast. That is Mr. Augie Gonzalez, Director of Product Marketing at DataCore. Augie, are you with us? I am, David. How are you? I'm great. Thanks for being on. Take it away. Okay, well, if, if there's anything we can count on these days is that our best laid plans can basically go sideways in a, in a snap. So th the advice that follows will help you maintain business continuity by adapting to those inevitable yet unforeseen turn of events certain to shake things up. And we'll start with that. I think the first piece of advice is you really need to take an objective self-assessment of the risk that you're facing. Uh, identifying specifically the critical dependencies whose failure would cause a, a number of cascading circumstances. None of them good, but all quite preventable. And so with, uh, with a couple of decades under our belt, we've learned to spot some of the choices, the tactical choices you might be making that uh, fail to account for this recurring upheaval that's just around the corner. And what I want to do is share some of those lessons with you and hopefully you walk away with some really good tips on how to circumvent them. First, I'll start with a simple test that you can do. And it basically says, uh, jot down what would be the impact on your business continuity and disaster recovery strategy. How would it be, in fact, compromised if there was a substantial change in, let's say, your storage manufacturer, your suppliers, in the topology that you chose, whether you were going from a three-tier SAN to, let's say, a hyperconverged system, or if the weather patterns shifted significantly in your area. And from those, you can arrive at a vulnerability index. And a high score here means trouble ahead. So you, you want to score low on this. This is like golf. First, let's talk a little bit about the weather. We're finding and I'm sure some of you right now experiencing in the in the northeast in the, the central part of the United States are encountering this that hurricanes, uh, floods, fire, ice, uh, hurricanes I, I point out is because I'm here down in Fort Lauderdale and that's what we run into. These 
these are area occurring in areas that we were once thinking that we were quite sheltered and quite distant from, and they're surprising us left and right. But uh, there's only so much that we can do there. I think we take some measures, but part of that is we now need to consider also self-inflicted sources of disruption outside of these. And the first of these, I think, is a curious one. Several of you, no doubt, are starting to shop around for your next refresh of storage. And after extensive research, you're bound to fall in love with maybe a new all-flash array, all equipped with the latest bells and whistles, sure to give you the performance you're after and the high availability that your users expect. But how would that affect your vulnerability index? That same question. Well, let's fast forward a year or two when a brand new model pops up from another manufacturer and just entices you with a, a sweet price you can't walk away from. It suddenly becomes really apparent that any of your BC or DR practices that relied on the embedded capabilities of that current AFA aren't going to cut it. Part of that results from the way these functions are implemented. I think some of the other members that are presenting to you today are describing how, how they run things like replication and mirroring between inside their arrays. But what you have to understand is when you substitute a new supplier in here, they handle that quite differently. And that starts to create this, uh, these variables in your BC plan that you had not expected, and yet you have to account for them. You simply, even throughout the period where both coexist, that's a difficult situation. So part of what uh, Data Core brings to the party here is a proposal to consolidate those data protection services in a uniform control plane. In effect, we're lifting the functions that perform things like replication, et cetera, outside above the storage systems so that you can in substitute whatever you like underneath and those practices remain in place. And this is the distinction that's shown in the, in the slide here. The number of services are quite comprehensive. So in this control plane, you have the complete continuum of safeguards. They include for a zero RTO, RPO, you can run with our synchronous mirroring, auto failover and fail back can extend that with uh, three-way resiliency. And I'll walk through a few of these things in the ensuing parts of the slides. And then when you have to protect against regional disasters, you'd be using something like our async replication and its companion, the advanced site recovery. And this software, all of these software titles then are able to operate independent of the storage supplier you've chosen and the generation of storage device that's in place. That is today's, what you have on the floor today, and what you hope to purchase in the future. And then at the other extreme are functions like the continuous data protection and the snapshot functions, which help you restore back to a previous point in time. In particular, what I'd like to point out is that CDP is one of the major ways to combat the effects of ransomware, where you can do a rewind, a DVR-like function on your data and bring it back to just before the cyber attack occurred. It's a very powerful way to thumb your nose up at the, the attackers, the perpetrators. What I'm getting across here is that regardless of the choices you make in terms of your st storage footprint and the choices you make in suppliers and gear, you're going to be able to maintain the same processes and do this even as you refresh or expand without disruption. So that's a critical part. How do I maintain a smooth operation even though there's quite a bit of chaos going on in the background? In, in this case, what you're seeing is the substitution of an, an old array by a new one and that the data migration that's required to pull that off and not hiccup, not create a hiccup for your your users occurs all in the background without consuming host cycles or reducing the, the performance of those applications. 
So the idea is that this is something that happens on a regular basis, whether it's a yearly basis for some people. Some have lease programs that are swapping out gear even more regularly. There's some amount of the storage that's getting refreshed. And normally that requires quite a bit of planned downtime, a very stressful situation as you pull that off with the data core software. All of this can be done during normal working hours without having to schedule any interruptions. It also applies, I mentioned that one of the vulnerability indexes, these changes in the topology. And what I mean by that is there's a number of organizations that are traditionally run large SAN environments, storage area networks with large arrays behind them, storage arrays and are considering tapping into the capabilities of hyperconverged systems. The data core software in this case allows you to operate across these very dissimilar topologies with the same uniform set of practices again. So you could, for example, complement the existing three-tier SAN by having your the other part of your highly available cluster operate off of an HCI, a small HCI node that takes on responsibilities for the active-active copy of, in that mirrored pair. Or you might choose to use another supplier at the DR site or at the other colo because you've gotten a, a pretty good deal on that one and that's the way you first phase in the new supplier. As a, on, the, on the copy side of this thing. This is something that you don't have clearly, and one of the, the walkaways from this is if you, if you place a reliance on the hardware array for data protection, it's going to undermine the utility of that unit the moment it has to be replaced. And, and some of you will say, well, yes, but I'm going to standardize on this gear, and for perpetuity, I, explain, I plan to be buying from the same supplier, and they guarantee that I can swap things out. Well, uh, that's, that's a good aspiration, but through a couple of decades of practice that I've seen, it never quite works out that way. And I think your colleagues who will be second-guessing you a year or two from now will shine a, a big spotlight on that. The second no-no here is that don't settle for a process, a disaster preparedness process that is based on a specific topology, because that will come back to bite you as well. And it's very, very short-sighted. And there's also too many variables that can affect the quality of service. And the last piece of uh, no-no I would say is don't, don't, don't view this as, as a fractional adventure where you're trying to piece together point products if you really are expecting a coherent lasting solution because it just doesn't work out and you end up getting into bigger headaches than you started with. So I want to give you a couple of examples of how this is used in, in the world, in the wild. This is the Maimonides Medical Center in Manhattan. They run uh, data core. They've been running data core for many years. And part of their transition that they've been through has been uh, quite fabulous indeed. They started with uh, a single supplier for storage, it was IBM, and a single location, which they then ran out of room basically and wanted more uh, high availability. So they built a second MIS facility some blocks away and created and basically moved part of those workloads and some of the storage components across to the new facility as they expanded at the same time. That transition was made possible uninterrupted by using data core software as this control plane on top of it without any storage related downtime. Quite a remarkable feat when you consider how much goes into swapping out data centers. And it's no small environment. You can see it's running about one petabyte last time I checked with them, quite a number of users. And now they've introduced the uh, XIO for a tier, tier two, I would say, storage to complement the IBM. So they're able to take advantage of very high performance as well as mid-range price performance gear in this configuration, yet apply a common way to address their 
business continuity requirements. And they do this not only for live critical applications, but even more of the mon mundane things like billing, which is where a lot of people place their focus. This diagram is uh, for some of you who are more on the networking side and are curious how these things get plumbed. And in this case, we have two sites, the west and east site, where the west site is running Dell Compellent storage from that generation, and the east site had standardized on Equalogic. And some companies do this in, in effect to, as part of their normal modernization program. They're bringing in new gear. They decided to put the new gear in one of the locations, see how that works out, and then uh, apply it to the other. And they continuously upgrade their environments this way. And you can see there's a number of inner site links that make this up. And the best practices are there. there's no single point of failure here. There's always redundant paths, and those paths uh, can be severed independently while everything continues to operate very, very clearly. And we can give you quite a bit of tips on this. Here's a slightly different view from another one of our healthcare customers. In this case, they run three sites. And two of those sites, the two sites in Manhattan, share a hot site in Secaucus, New Jersey. This worked out very well for them during Superstorm Sandy because the island, Manhattan, was flooded. I guess I don't know if it's an island or a peninsula, got flooded during that. And there was several outages in that area, as some of you have experienced. And fortunately, they were able to fail over all their operations from, an, from the IT critical operations that they needed to maintain to the high and dry ground in the Jersey Colo. So that's how they approach it. They, it's a shared site that both are in real time mirroring all the data to. And at any point in time, they can shut either of those facilities down and keep operations running from the, the second site. Another flavor of this is where the paranoia is even greater. And we're looking for a third copy of the information for redundancy. So in this case, we are making two synchronous mirror copies from the original. And at any one point, you can remove one of those members that has, let's say in this one, it's the west node that's being uh, taken out of service. Perhaps they're doing upgrades to the equipment or to the switching infrastructure, just uh, the normal care of that. The other two then can maintain full high availability and, and completely handle the load without affecting any of the, the application SLAs. And at any one point, you can flip any of these around. You can go through this in a round robin fashion to completely exercise the, the upgrades as needed. For a Quick look at the user interface. This gives you an idea how you might control from a single pane of glass the entire operation across dissimilar storage so that your provisioning, your data protection, and all your performance and statistical analytical information is available to you, even though you have a myriad of gear from different suppliers. So this is the, the common point for command and control that gives you complete access to this without worrying about the nuances of any particular device type or manufacturer. So in effect, what we're doing is we're standardizing the business continuity and disaster recovery practices despite the diverse environment that you might be operating on. And we recognize that whether you're a small data center or a growing expansive one with multiple sites, that it's unlikely you can maintain kind of this really constant standard uh, view of that, that there's always quite a bit of movement. There's always the injection of new technology in here and new, new ways to architect, including the cloud, as part of as an enhanced area to supplement that. So with Data Core, you're able to manage all those and provision and control those centrally. 
Now, this uh, topology independent applies also to our licenses. So uh, for those who are curious about how this is the software's priced, there's basically three editions of it. There's the enterprise class. It provides all the bells and whistles and has the highest performance. And then we have our, our mid standard mid-range offering called the ST edition. And that covers most of the circumstances people work with, as well as there's a, the third edition, which is the large-scale secondary storage, where you have very cheap and deep storage you're trying to protect and include that. But any of these licenses apply and operate across this quite uh, broad range of architecture. So whether you're trying to pool and virtualize external storage arrays, or whether you're trying to build what are known as storage servers, hyperconverged systems, or some hybrid of those, that same license that you acquired initially can operate and move transparently across this very, very different behaviors. I've only touched on a few of the capabilities that apply to data protection and DR, but here you have a glance at some of the other capabilities that are included in the software stack, as well as some of the operational insights that you gleaned from the historical charting and the analytics package that comes with it, and some of the command and control interfaces you have access. So along with the UI, you have uh, REST APIs to orchestrate some of the behavior alongside some of the other activities that uh, are running on the system. Very, very rich collection of data services that you expect to run infrastructure-wide. With that, I want to point out that uh, business continuity and disaster recovery is but one reason to engage with DataCore. Anytime you're about to undertake a storage expansion, say, or storage refresh, that's a really good time to call us before you make that move, because we can really help you scope what that would be and maybe give you some avenues that you had not uh, considered in the past. It's especially important if you're going through any major infrastructure consolidation where you're trying to collapse the environment, and uh, especially as you start to branch out also into some of your robo facilities and apply the same techniques, protect them as well as you do your main data center. So there's, um, to, to recap, there's five responsibilities I think that will be most helpful to you by using data core software. The first of this is to ensure that you have uninterrupted access to your data as hardware ages and new gear replaces it. So that's, um, that's job one, keep things moving, keep it current, keep it modern. The second is to be able to migrate the data behind the scenes so that uh, if you're moving the, to a new equipment or moving that equipment to a new location, that does not cause any disruptions. And then the, uh, the third piece of this is we can help you to sidestep failures and outages that, that would otherwise uh, create quite a bit of havoc for you. We do this by pooling capacity across otherwise isolated devices, and that allows you some additional benefits, which include the ability to share it equitably among consumers. And that also, at the same time, we can authenticate who those consumers are and regulate the quality of service according to priorities. So we don't have uh, rogue machines taking on either more capacity or more bandwidth than they should be given. That's all part of the stack. So with that, um, I just want to field some questions and see what we uh, wrap up here. Yeah, great presentation, Augie. Um, we are going to do some Q&A, but first let me pop up this poll question for the audience. Would you like to be one of the first to learn more about the data core solution? So uh, there's a couple questions here uh, related to you know distance between locations. Uh, Wasim is asking, it looks like it would work well within a shared site within, for example, North America. But what about you know an uh, office in Cambridge and then another one in Europe and another one in APAC? Could this be uh, used in a global scenario? Yes, it can, and many of our customers operate multinationals, 
They generally are using asynchronous replication and they act as reciprocal DR sites for each other. Okay, very nice. Is there some sort of maximum distance that you can stretch, uh, uh, for example, a metro cluster? Well, metro clusters do have some finite speed of light constraints. They're typically in the 100 miles or so. It, uh, it really has to do with the round trip latencies. M many clusters at the application level, not necessarily at the data core level, but the application level, those clusters require you to have either 5 millisecond or 10 millisecond round trip time. And that's maybe, uh, that falls into that 60 mile, 100 mile limit. So that's meant to be a metropolitan solution. When you're getting cross region, then you deal with asynchronous where you disconnect the, the response time from the transmission. Okay. And then another question here, Richard's asking, you know, maybe he said, maybe I missed it, but is there any ac accommodation for using public cloud with data core? There is, yes. I briefly touched on it, but we have a, for example, a, a cloud replication. So you can run an instance of data core on prem and an instance in the cloud and replicate between those. You'll see one of our titles there on even on Azure but it's also can run on AWS, Google Cloud, or a, a private cloud that you may be contracting with through a regional CSP. Okay, and then what about NVMe storage? Do you support NVMe at this point? We do, yes, NVMe and a host of other protocols. In fact, as they arrive, we've pretty much on them because we don't really require any special funky APIs or anything to talk to the storage, those we inherently gain some of the compatibility that comes right out of the, the initial deliverable of those those drives, those flash drives. Okay. And then another question here, how do you control the storage that's underneath you? Are there any special APIs that I have to worry about? No, fortunately not, and that's what part of the longevity and the ability to do this in a general way that DataCore has been doing this for, for some time, is that we use standard in-band controls, which all of these storage devices have to adhere to. So the standard protocol is basically all they need, and as long as we're talking that same handshake, they're good with it and we're good with it. Okay, excellent. Well, I think that's all the questions we have. Uh, James said, this is fantastic. Thanks, Data Core team. Great presentation. So uh, thanks for being on the event today, Augie. Thank you, Dave. Bye-bye. For more information on Data Core, check out the handout that's there in your audience console or visit datacore.com. And before I introduce our next presenter, we have a couple of prizes here to give away. Um, we've got an Amazon $500 gift card going out to Adam Davenport from Kansas and a grand prize and another Mac Mini going out to, uh, I believe it's Yik Wong from California. Congratulations, uh, Yik Wong from California and Adam Davenport from Kansas. More big prizes to give away, so make sure you stay tuned. And now it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Mr. Jeffrey Leeds, Global Senior Alliance Manager for Data Protection Partnerships, and Joseph, uh, Yasi Wise, uh, Senior Manager of Product Management at NetApp. Uh, Jeffrey and Yasi, are you there? Yes, we, we are. sure are. This Good is afternoon. Jeff. Thanks for being on the event today. Take it away. Thank you. So uh, in, in introductions, Yossi Wise, I'm a Senior Product Management here at NetApp focused on data protection. And Jeff, anything to add? Yeah. Hi, my name is Jeffrey Leeds. I work uh, in uh, NetApp's Global Alliance team, and I manage the large data protection partnerships. Awesome. Thank you, Jeff. So jumping right into it, um, when we usually present about this, we try to convince people that data protection is really, really critical. Now, I don't think we need to convince this crowd that data protection is critical. But what we also try to tell people is that just as downtime is expensive, protecting against downtime and getting ironclad protection is also very expensive. So that really means that this is a space where your business needs to evaluate solutions really carefully and focus 
not on not only on the capabilities of the solution but also on the overall integration and the efficiency of the proposed solution for data protection now now why do we have such a great focus about this at netapp well we at netapp have this architecture that we call the data fabric and it really encompasses and covers all the products and services that we offer at netapp uh, we look at it to be part of our own digital transformation at netapp um, Historically, you may have known NetApp as a, as a provider of data storage arrays or all flash arrays, and that's really a core of our business under enterprise IT. However, when you look at the data fabric, we now have presence in the public cloud, in the public clouds uh, with both product and services, as well as we provide key technologies in the HCI space for on-premise cloud. Now, why? Why do I mention all of this in the context of data protection? Because B, all these technologies and products play as part of the data fabric and share the same capabilities with regard for data protection. Those capabilities include the ability to take sh snapshots super efficiently and then make copies of the data in a super efficient manner, both from a resource and space perspective. So when we look at data protection here at NetApp, uh, we bring a unique vision to that. So many vendors and many people think that data protection is all about the core protection features and capabilities. Can you take a backup? Can you quickly restore it? Can you efficiently store copies of the data? We see that as that, we agree, that is a basic capability of a, of a solution and it is there to focus on risk mitigation. But as you scale up your environment, as you grow, and for medium and large customers, it's a reality on day one, managing at scale can become a challenge and making sure that all your systems work and run to the same policy, be they on-premise, your private cloud, or a public cloud. Tying it all together and managing the mixed in environment, that's where the costs can start to add up. So being able to go with a solution that gives you the efficiency and reliability at scale and in the simplicity of management is critical. What we also see as an evolving space and is the wish and the need to do more with your data and utilize copies of your data wherever they live. So in October, we debuted a, a capability to go and run analytics in the cloud off data that gets backed up from on-premise. So we see the third tier of our data protection approach as the ability to leverage your data where it is, wherever it is, wherever the copies are, be they backup or availability copies, to drive what your business needs, whether it is DevOps and testing the clouds, et cetera. So with that, let me hand it off to Jeff that will talk a little more about our offerings. Jeff, go ahead. Thanks, Yossi. Thanks, everyone, for your attention today. So uh, Yossi, we can pop to the next slide here. Um, so we talk about <clears throat> three major uh, NetApp data protection offerings. And the first one that we'll just briefly talk about is a new one that's, that's going to be coming out very soon. That's called NetApp Data Availability Services, or NDAS. And this is a, a solution for hybrid cloud orchestration. Uh, it is going to be deployed in AWS. And this is for uh, NetApp ONTAP environments only today. The second one, and the second two that I'm going to talk about, talk about the partnerships, which is why I'm on the call here today with you. So I manage these two very large partners, uh, both Cobalt and Veeam. So we've recently added uh, our, these two products onto the NetApp price book, so they can be purchased directly from NetApp, and they both have very deep integration with NetApp. So the first one is Cobalt Complete Backup and Recovery. This is a newer packaging that Cobalt come up for their product. They've got incredibly rich uh, in integrations with uh, across the NetApp portfolio. So we've had ONTAP integrations for years with, this, uh, with these products, but we now also add our Element OS, which is our the NetApp HCI and SolidFire, our E-Series, which is our rich, deep, and, and extremely economical uh, backup target, and Storage Grid for private cloud. And then in October, we also added Veeam Backup and Recovery and the Veeam Availability Suite. So Veeam brings <clears throat> incredibly rich monitoring, reporting, and, and capacity planning capabilities uh, for our customers, and they also have very rich integrations across the NetApp portfolios, including NetApp, including the ONTAP. Uh. Okay, so let's go to the next slide. So if you kind of look at 
<clears throat> our, our scenario is NetApp, we are going to do what we do very well, which is manage data, store data, whether it's, whether it's in hybrid cloud, on-prem, in the cloud 100% or some mix of that. And then we're going to partner very hard with two Magic Quadrant leaders, Forrester Wave leaders, Cobalt and Veeam. So we look at kind of a way of being able to position with NetApp only solutions for simple, quick uh, business outcomes, hybrid cloud, and then moving up into the, to the Cobalt solutions for comprehensive support of, of mixed environments. So if you've got legacy storage systems that you need to talk to, you've got old applications that need to be backed up correctly, and you have NAS file services. And then Veeam, born and bred in the virtualized in infrastructure, very simple to use, very fast to get up to speed, enabling you to be able to very quickly install and be able to manage your data. So the next slide will show you that we've kind of given you a snapshot here. This is just kind of an easy guide for your uh, environment as to which one of the solutions you, you will probably end up using. We also have NetApp Snap Center that the NetApp customers on the line are very familiar with, I'm sure, and support a wide variety of uh, configurations. We'll also have the NetApp Data Availability Services, or NDAS. You'll be hearing lots more about that. And this is really for our ONTAP customers to be able to take those snapshots, put them into AWS Cloud, and manage them there. And then we look at our two partnerships. The first one with Commvault, the next one with Veeam. And you can see where the differences lie with these guys. If you've got NAS file services, lots of physical servers, uh, Commvault's probably going to be the path you're going to go down. If you're going to be looking at highly virtualized environments that have uh, less sophistication on your, uh, on your teams, uh, Veeam's probably going to be the better solution for you to look at. So we'll go to the next slide. And we really look at these things as you know, cookies and milk. Um, we work very closely with both of these two vendors. Obviously, everyone knows that these guys are, are, uh, com compete against each other every day, but at NetApp, we think that they both bring a very vital piece to the table, and so we're very happy to be able to work with both of these guys. So whether you're doing full-featured on-tap snapshots or Element OS, enabling that, secondary, uh, that primary secondary storage target, or you're looking for long-term retention on E-Series using our storage grid, or even going to tape, which we know just won't die, uh, and then backup and recovery to NetApp from hundreds of third-party heterogeneous storage platforms. That's another reason that we really believe having these two products on our price book are really helping people to uh, enable their enterprise. So if we kind of look at this in a, in the, on the next slide, you'll see kind of a snapshot here of, and uh, let's just go ahead and build that out. So the NetApp data protection technologies here, this is kind of how we fit together. So you've got your production data center, and you've got your snapshots, and everyone is probably very familiar with NetApp snapshots. Using SnapMirror, we're able to take those snapshots and bring them over to our, our DR data center, where we're able to instantly recover and very quickly back up. And then finally, for long-term retention, you're able to go to the final backup system where you're able to archive for long-term storage. So if we kind of double-click into this on the next slide. Hey, hey Jeff, you, I think you missed yes. SnapLock. What does SnapLock do here? So SnapLock is a way of ensuring that your, snaps, that your, that your snapshots are never changed. And so this is really important. If you have, uh, you know, retention possibilities, uh, capabilities that you're requiring, or you've got fiduciary responsibility to ensure that the data never changes, you need to be using SnapLock. So the whole Snap Center components have a lot of rich functionality that we could go on for an hour, but we only have 20 minutes. <laughs> All right, on to the next slide. Okay. So <clears throat> a lot of people uh, ask me, so what do Commvault and Veeam do, and how do they complement NetApp? And so I've tried to put this as, as simply as possible. So on the NetApp side, when you've got your primary storage, whether it's AFF or FAS, you're, you're using snapshots for short-term recovery, fast and efficient space, uh, uh, fast and efficient space uh, uh, retention, uh, and, and production app cloning. But what, is, what do Veeam and Commvault both have in common here? Well, NetApp requires their help to catalog the snapshot content and provide granular levels of restore for both data and applications. 
So now let's go over to our medium-term recovery site where we're, a we're able to very quickly bring things over. We're using SnapMirror and SnapVault over here to bring the snapshots. And this is where Veeam and Commvault are able to leverage those snapshot copies. And as, as Yossi mentioned, being able to actually make use of those snapshots, not on your primary, but on your secondary, is a huge value to customers. So you're able to use things over here on this site. You're able to do analytics. You're able to ensure that your backups actually work. You're able to look at those snapshots uh, through that catalog and really take advantage of it. And then finally, the backup and archiving tier, where Veeam and Commvault give granular recovery. You, you're trying to go back and recover files that were, that were stored out here many, many, many years ago. You may have that fiduciary responsibility, and you're able to be able to go ahead and quickly restore those. And then using Veeam and Commvault's S3 connectors, you're able to go out and do long-term storage, whether it's Microsoft Azure, AWS, or using NetApp Storage Grid. You're able to do that long-term retention so that you know that you've got that archive and you're 100% sure you're going to be able to restore those when you need them. And with that, I'm going to hand it back over to Yossi to talk a little bit more about NDAS, which is a new solution that NetApp has introduced. Thanks much, Jeff. So with data availability services, the key tenant is keep it simple. Keep it really, really simple. So the goal here is to allow to manage everything from the cloud using a web, simple web interface, but then control and apply policies to the primary on storage and secondary backup storage, which is on-premise, but then also get those copies out to the cloud and leverage the, the availability and cost benefit of certain cloud services to do things with the data. For example, index the data and allow you to do very highly granular restores of the data. But what we've also demoed is the ability to avail the data and, sh and use it with other cloud services such as analytics. So this is a place where we're investing because we believe that our ability to take your data to wherever you need to use it is key here, and the focus is keep it really, really simple. So. You know, if we were to say, what would we want you to take away from this, right? This is the partnership that we have between the data fabric, the storage systems that live and talk to each other across the data fabric, and the data protection orchestration tools, Commvault and Veeam. With our deep partnership here, we have the power of the storage snapshot. That is a key thing because that enables you to take backups with zero impact to production. That means you can meet your availability and backup requirements in a far more economical fashion because usually taking a backup will take a lot of resources out of your production gear, not with our solutions. And another feature here is that when you use a secondary site that's driven off NetApp, the, the, we have the ability to drive instant VM recovery and utilize the storage snapshots to drive the recovery and availability scenarios. So, you get the, be the benefit of both worlds. You use all the sort of hardware or storage acceleration of our products and the simplicity and comprehensive management tools of our data protection partners. So where, where would you, what would we want you to do? So we want you to go learn more about this and learn about our approach and how we envision data protection moving from simple protection to highly managed policies to a place where your data can do more for you in the cloud and on-premise. There are links here to our sites that have a specific information with regards to our partners, and we have a download available with inf more information about how IDC views the, uh, the Veeam and NetApp together. Thank you very much. Great presentation, Yossi and Jeffrey. Uh, very cool stuff. Let me. Uh, go ahead and ask some questions now from the audience. And while I do that, I'm going to pop up the poll question on this screen for the audience in the slides window. It says, would you like to be one of the first to learn more about the NetApp solution? So let's see, first question that came in here, um, they're asking, can you explain uh, the advantages of having tight integration between the storage and the backup software? Why is that important? Jeff, let me, uh, let me go I'll ahead take, and try to take that, and then, and then uh, Yossi, you can jump in. 
So I think that <clears throat> having your, uh, your backup and recovery product being storage aware is really important. Uh, you know, NetApp has spent years and years improving our on-tap technology, and it is the best snapshotting technology we believe in the industry. And enabling the customer to keep things in that, in that snapshot window and keeping that snapshot, uh, is, that's all the efficiency that we've brought to the table. So if you were to, to break that snapshot up and just turn it into a simple streaming backup, you've lost all of the efficiency and all of the value that we're able to bring to the customer with snapshots. And so this was not a trivial lift for us to be able to do these integrations. These took years and years of work and lots and lots of engineering dollars and hours to be able to make these work. So we believe that it's really important for our, our two big uh, backup and recovery vendors to be able to speak fluent snapshots for both our Element OS and for our ONTAP systems. I'll let Yossi jump in if he has anything to add to that. You've covered it well. Thanks, Jeff. Okay. Thank you. All right. Let's see. Another question here. Richard is asking, um, how would the licensing work between Commvault and NetApp and, and Veeam or you know, NetApp and Commvault or NetApp and Veeam? How, do, how does that licensing work? Do you need additional licenses? So if you're already a Commvault or you're already a Veeam customer, their products are going to work seamlessly with NetApp when you're using ONTAP or our Element operating system. So either of those are going to snap directly in. There's not going to be any additional licensing fee. If you're not currently a Veeam or a Commvault customer, you can acquire those licenses either through your traditional channel partner or you can acquire those directly from NetApp. And what we're finding is a lot of customers like to have everything on one purchase order, uh, have everything come from one vendor, and have everything arrive together. So, of course, naturally, if you're not a, a Commvault or Veeam customer, we'd love to talk to you, and Veeam and Commvault would love to talk to you about becoming a customer. If you already are, those work seamlessly, and there are no extra costs for any of those plugins. Okay. And this is an interesting question. Can storage snapshots protect against malware? I'll let, I'll let Yossi answer that one. Oh, the answer is not only malware, but even a rogue admin. Because when when you use stored snapshots, you can basically mark them uh, using our Snap Vault technology. Mark them as immutable, may not be changed, may not be deleted. There's a policy uh, applied which got, it tells the system to maintain that snapshot for a number of days, months, or years. And hence, once you set the policy in flight, you audit that the policy is not changed. Your backups are immutable. They cannot be changed by anything, not by, not by rogue software on your network, nor by a rogue admin in your environment. Very nice. Very nice. I like that. And then here's another interesting question. This is, uh, I mean, I've heard it both ways. Uh, they're asking, is a snapshot actually a backup or not? What, what's your take on this? So that's an age-old discussion, right? And the, rea uh, the reality is that it really depends on your specific requirements and what do you mean by a backup. Uh, we believe that uh, for many of our customers that uh, snapshots are a viable alternative for, for a dedicated bio backup appliance or a backup target, and they provide a more cost-effective way to maintain and achieve the backup and data availability needs. Couple that with our partner software with Commvault and Veeam, and you get the best of both worlds. You get the efficiency of snapshots that are in the management of a backup and availability solution uh, software that leverages the hardware capabilities. So I, my answer would be with our storage, with our software partners, our, our snapshots are become truly a backup for most customers. Okay. And then uh, Morgan here asked a follow-up question. Can we restore from a snapshot? That's a great question. Uh, answer is not only can you restore from a snapshot, you can uh, using a, a feature we call snap clone, you can instantaneously bring up a copy of the, of the, envi of the backed up environment and mount that and execute that. So you can not only go ahead and restore a snapshot back to the source location, but you can also go ahead and bring up, for example, a test or development environment or a, a, uh, an availability solution for disaster recovery. Okay. All right. Excellent. 
well, I'm learning stuff too on this event. So thank you very much. Um, let's see, I think we have time for one more quick question. Uh, Eric is asking, how about file level restore? If you have a snapshot, is it possible to do that? So with fi for file level restore, uh, there are two key technologies. You need to have an index to be able to find a specific version of a file. And that capability is provided by either our software such as Data Availability Services or our pa partner software Convault and Veeam. Once you've identified the file that you want to restore, you can do that through the software or you can go directly to the storage system, instantiate a copy of the entire snapshot uh, without consuming any space using our Flex clone technology, and then basically find that file that you've identified and take a, and copy it or use it. So yes, you can go and very efficiently take a snapshot and access an individual file on it without requiring any sort of additional space of restoring the whole snapshot. Excellent, excellent. All right, well, I think that's all the time we have for live questions, but a really great presentation, really insightful. Thank you, Yossi, and thank you, Jeffrey. Thank you very you much. Our pleasure. For more information on NetApp, of course, visit netapp.com. Um, also check out the handout that's available right there in your audience console on the handouts tab, and it covers the business value snapshot that you can get with the NetApp solution. All right, and now it's time to announce our next set of prize winners. We have uh, Thomas Hall is the winner of an Amazon $500 gift card, Thomas Hall from Illinois. And the next grand prize winner is Chris Mulliken from North Carolina. Congratulations, Chris Mulliken from North Carolina. You won a Mac Mini, and Thomas Hall, you won an Amazon $500 gift card. All right, I'm going to pop up a poll question here that I had up a little bit earlier, but I don't think everyone got a chance to answer. So I'm just going to pop this question up. It says, what's your time frame for updating or selecting a new data protection solution? I'll leave that up and let everyone answer it. I am here. We did not lose audio. I took a sip of water while I popped up the full question. Uh, but now it's time to continue on with our event because we have more great presenters and more prizes to give away. Uh, and with that, I'm about to announce our next presenter. It's my pleasure to now introduce uh, Mr. Jay Ellis, Senior Sales Engineer at Unitrends. Jay, are you with us? Yes, I'm here. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thanks for being on the Data Protection Megacast, Jay. Take it away. All right. Um, again, uh, thanks everyone for taking time away from a busy day to uh, attend this mega cast. Um, as mentioned, I'm Jay Ellis, the senior sales engineer with the Unitrends, and uh, I've been in the technology industry for uh, the past 20 years. And uh, the last five, I focused on the disaster recovery. Um, so I'm aware that some of you may have never heard of Unitrends, and others uh, may know something. So for the next 20 minutes, I plan to give an overview of how Unitrends may assist you if hit with a disaster. All right. Uh, so Unitrends was founded in uh, 1989. Uh, we're headquartered in uh, Burlington, Massachusetts. Uh, we started off as a software company, and uh, due to high demand, uh, we developed a physical appliance. Uh, we manage our own purpose-built a cloud with data centers in the U.S., Canada, uh, U.K., Germany, and Australia. Um, our support team, uh, along with R&D, uh, they're located in Columbia, uh, South Carolina. Today, uh, we have more than 30,000 30, customers worldwide, and uh, Unitrends is protecting more than two exabyte, uh, exabytes of data locally and more than 100 petabytes in our cloud. Uh, we maintain uh, industry-leading 98% uh, customer satisfaction. Uh, so let's talk about the key backup and recovery challenges to implement along with cost-saving ways Unitrends uh, can eliminate some of those challenges. Uh, providing uh, business continuity is, is no longer uh, 
just uh, about local data. Uh, today, uh, companies have multiple clouds, meaning that uh, there are multiple and different DR strategies. Uh, technologies can vary greatly across different types of clouds, so uh, one protection strategy uh, may not. Um, so uh, technologies can, can vary greatly across different types of clouds, so that one protection strategy uh, may work somewhere else and may not fit uh, your scenario. Um, you need to have data protection and recovery process for each element of your computing strategy. Um, uh, so there's this misconception that if you're using a hosted application, uh, your data is being backed up, and that's absolutely false. Uh, I recommend reading the fine print. Um, all hosted applications are being backed up from an infrastructure standpoint uh, to protect, protect their environment, but generally there are no SLAs to guarantee business continuity. Um, I know a lot of us are using uh, Office 365. Uh, that's a pretty popular SaaS application today, uh, Salesforce, and, and some of the others out there. Uh, the challenge comes in, in that uh, you don't want a hodgepodge of backup solutions, each with their own user interface, uh, service organizations, and recovery procedures. Um, you, need a, uh, you need an integrated backup and disaster recovery architecture that allows you to easily set up automated tasks, uh, complete and total recovery capabilities, advanced, tech, uh, advanced testing, and data protection. Okay, so when, when you look on the left here, uh, you have what we call uh, the old world. Um, you'll have uh, servers, you'll have storage, um, you'll have your hypervisor, um, you're going to have, of course, your OS that's running on those guest VMs, and then you're going to have some type of uh, backup solution in place. Um, and then there's going to be probably, uh, possibly some type of uh, cloud infrastructure. Um, there are uh, companies that are leveraging uh, infrastructure as a service uh, to host their systems. And then there's the cloud backup. So there's multiple layers uh, to the DR solution. And what we've noticed is that uh, that can lead to a finger pointing. Um, you have the hardware vendor that says, hey, um, it's not our problem, uh, the backups failed, they're not working, or you may have um, the software vendor saying that, hey, uh, the backup software is working. Um, you can't replicate it off-site. You can't uh, manage the backup chain. Um, it's something with your, your WAN connection. So there's a lot of finger pointing that's going on. So uh, the way we see it, we bring it all together in a single uh, vendor and interface. Uh, the hardware and software comes uh, fully loaded in our recovery series of clients, and uh, it can optionally integrate with the Unitrans cloud for off-site storage, uh, long-term compliance, and even failover. Uh, and keep in mind with some of the, uh, the competitors that are out there uh, that do offer appliances, a lot of times uh, they're Windows-based appliances. So keep in mind that we're, we're a Linux-based appliance, and a lot of times what we find is that um, those ransomware attacks, uh, those type of malware viruses, um, they're targeting Windows systems. So uh, that's something you definitely want to keep in mind when you're looking at uh, your DR solution. In addition to that, uh, there are some other features that come bundled with our software. Uh, one is the ransomware detection. Um, it's probably a little bit different from uh, some of the others out there. We're not going to send it to some hosted site. So each time we take a, a, a snapshot, um, we're going to inspect those packets, and we're going to compare them with the previous backup. So within our, our software, we have these learned uh, algorithms, and uh, what we're going to do is compare it to those algorithms. So there's no need to send this data off-site. And based off these learned behavior patterns that we've uh, determined, if any of those behavior patterns resemble uh, ransomware, what we'll do at that point is uh, we'll give an alert or notification. So we won't discontinue those backups. We won't take those backups offline, but what we will do is notify you. And uh, just based off my time in the industry, um, some of the things that I've seen is that when it comes to ransomware, um, it may take a day or two uh, before uh, uh, a business have, have may notice that they've been infected, or sometimes it may take a week. So with our uh, ransomware protection that's built into the software, we're able to uh, detect that right away. 
In addition to the centralized management console and the ability to create role-based access, so if uh, there's a need to uh, to uh, manage multiple sites, uh, it doesn't require you to log into multiple uh, uh, portals or log into multiple appliances. It's all done from that single pane of glass. Even to the point, if if you're trying to perform some type of recovery, if you're looking to pull data back from the Unitrans cloud or if you're looking to pull data back uh, from uh, a secondary location, a DR site, again, it's all done from that single pane of glass. So uh, what does the Unitrans solution, uh, DRAS solution, looks like? Here you'll see we have the customer uh, uh, with the, the appliance there on site and they're replicating to the uh, Unitrans cloud. Um, up in the Unitrans cloud, that is a, a Unitrans appliance that uh, you will be replicating to. If for some reason uh, there's a disaster or if uh, you have a system that's uh, been corrupted and you need, excuse me, you need to spin that up in the Unitrans cloud, at that point, if you're leveraging our DRAS, um, we have the ability to spin those systems up in our DRAS stack. Um, we're going to have the storage that the available there in our cloud. Um, we have the ability to spin up physical virtual machines, uh, VMware, Hyper-V, in addition to our reliable, reliable DR testing. Uh, that's where we have the ability to go in and uh, do that schedule recovery testing for you and generate recovery uh, compliance reporting. So. Uh, what a lot of our competitors uh, general, re generally refer to when they say testing is just simply uh, maybe booting the system up, uh, getting to the Windows login screen, maybe taking a, a screenshot of that and sending that over to you. But um, we take that a step further. So with our recovery, our reliable uh, DR testing, uh, what we're going to do is we're going to actually validate the data that's on those systems. So, um, yes, it's very important that the the guest, the OS is up and running, but it's more important that that data is valid. So, uh, for instance, if it's an exchange server that we're backing up and replicating and you're leveraging uh, the DRAS, what we're going to do when we test, we have the ability to go in and search uh, the, the databases on those exchange servers. If you wanted to do a search for, say, John's Doe mail, uh, mail, see if he has mail in his box, um, we have the ability to do that with our testing. Uh, and not only that, the, the other unique piece about the DRAS is not only we're doing the testing, we're spinning those systems up, but the customers at that point have options as far as accessing their data that's up in the Unitrends cloud. So, if the, uh, and of course, you're going to access that using SSL VPN, and we'll assist with those network uh, connections. So, if you're looking to uh, connect using a, a, a client-to-site VPN or site-to-site VPN, um, we're going to do that part and assist with you. Um, again, uh, some of the things that I've noticed uh, just from my time in, in this disaster recovery space is that um, a lot of times it's the responsibility of the end users to, to figure out the networking piece to get that up and get it going. And we just figured that here at Unitrend, um, we like to take all the guesswork out of that. So um, we're going to assist you with that. So in the event of a disaster, um, um, the only thing you would have to do is call our support and say, hey, we're ready to fail over and spin up these systems, and uh, we'll take over from there. And then at some point, um, of course, when you're up and running, we're still going to continue to back up those systems in the Unitrends cloud. So we're going to have another UV that we're backing up to and capturing all the changes in that data for you. And then at some point, um, yes, you're going to fail back either uh, to the original site, and we can do that either by sending out another Unitrend, Unitrend's replacement appliance, or you can pull that data down. All right, let's go ahead and move forward to the next. Uh, so uh, what are some of the advantages of the, the Unitrend's cloud? Uh, First and foremost, you will not get an SLA from a public cloud provider because, uh, like I mentioned earlier, the user has to do all the work. Um, our Unitrends 
Cloud comes in uh, several different flavors. It's a tiered uh, model. Uh, we have what's called uh, our just forever unlimited uh, DRAS, and with that, of course, you're going to get the ability. You're going to you're going to have the ability to uh, spin up those systems. Uh, but with the standard uh, just DRAS, uh, we don't offer the testing. Uh, we do have an elite and premium uh, SLA where we guarantee that with the elite, your systems will be up and running within 24 hours. Or if you decide to go the premium route, it's a one-hour SLA. Keep in mind, the uh, 24-hour SLA comes with uh, monthly recovery testing, and the premium uh, one-hour uh, SLA com comes with weekly testing. Um, it's all a part of our true uh, white glove service. And some of the other things that uh, comes with our, our white glove service is the ability that we're going to build a custom DR plan for with you, along with you. Um, a lot of times when you go out and you purchase uh, a DR solution, um, they're going to tell you and sell you on all these bells and whistles, but um, it's still left uh, up to the user themselves to kind of figure this out and see what's best and how and what order to proceed and make sure that um, in the event of the disaster you're going to fell over. But, um, again, we're going to take all the guesswork out of that. Um, we're going to have someone that's assigned to you that's a part of our onboarding team that's going to assist with that DR plan, which includes identifying the protected systems, um, ensuring that uh, uh, a successful replication to the Unitrans cloud, and, of course, uh, probably one of the most important and crucial pieces is uh, setting up the network configuration that's in accordance with your production um, and when I say that, the network piece, I know one of the, the questions that I always get is uh, uh, how do we go about setting up as far as the IP if we're hosting our exchange? So um, there's two ways of doing that. Um, you have the ability to use a uh, pool from our DHCP pool, or if you prefer, we do have uh, the ability to reserve static IPs for you. Uh, and not only that, um, we also sit down and determine what's important as far as the dependencies, the boot order. Um, there may be a scenario where um, you have maybe uh, 30 servers, and what I've seen from a lot of our users that a lot of that isn't critical data. So you may choose to replicate that to the cloud, the Unitrans cloud, and choose only a few of those systems that, as crucial systems that need to be spun up immediately in the event of a disaster. And keep in mind that we're going to uh, continuously monitor these systems. Um, and if there are any uh, change requests, those are always accepted. Uh, we do have our rapid seed service. Uh, that's where we're going to assist with seeding those base images. Uh, we'll send out those drives. So um, if bandwidth's a concern, uh, there's no need to worry about replicating terabytes of data across your WAN connection. Uh, we're only going to replicate those uh, incrementals, so we'll send out uh, that C drive for that. And then, again, as far as the, the testing goes, um, we're going to execute those scripts for you to verify that that data is valid and generate uh, compliance reports. So uh, these are a couple of the, the promos that we're running for uh, Q1. Uh, the first is uh, by three years. Uh, DRAS pay for only two. Um, it includes uh, all levels of our DRAS and all retention periods. Uh, one thing that I, I want to mention that that's uh, something different from a lot of our competitors, um, when you're pricing out and you're looking at the Unitrends Cloud, um, uh, we sell that in 500 gig increments. Keep in mind that you may have a retention policy of seven years or eight years, and you may um, – you may want to keep uh, six months' worth of dailies, uh, six months' worth of uh, weeklies, or multiple years of annual backups. Um, we don't take that into consideration when we're uh, when we're when you're uh, purchasing uh, due to Unitrans Cloud. Uh, we're just looking at the actual raw data size, so that's something that you want to keep in mind. And then, of course, uh, the Forever Cloud uh, buy three years, get six months free. Uh, the Forever Cloud is basically just the archive where we're going to send that off. And uh, if you need that data back, uh, we can send that overnight on a drive to you. 
And, uh, again, if you guys have any questions, uh, please feel free to reach out to Unitrends.com. Um, you can request a demo. Uh, we have a, a support a team that's available that you can contact anytime. Great, pres- great presentation, Jay. Thank you very much. Uh, we do have some questions here for you, sure. if you're ready. Sure, go ahead. All right. Well, I ask you these questions. I'm going to pop up a poll question for the audience. Uh, if you're out there in the audience, check out the slides window. It says, would you like to be one of the first to learn more about the Unitrend solution that Jay just presented? So let's see, first question they're asking here, Joshua is asking, is the is the Unitrend D, a DRAS solution, is it a shared tenant among customers or is it dedicated? Um, it, it, it's dedicated. So um, there's no need to worry about cross-contamination as far as data. Um, when, when you're spinning up, you're going to have uh, – you're not you're, – you're going to replicate to a Unitrend's appliance, and there's no need to worry about um, other uh, clients that are replicating to the Unitrend's cloud having access to your data. Okay. Uh, Thomas is asking, does the Unitrend's on-site appliance have the ability to spin up a recovery virtual machine, or is that only available in the cloud? So the Unitrends appliance has the ability to uh, spin up a physical or virtual machine on the actual appliance. Okay, nice. Um, Missy's asking, uh, she said, you mentioned backup testing. What does your test entail, she asks. So the the, the test, when we're, when we're doing the testing, uh, again, if you're looking at the DRAS, um, you have the ability to tell us what it is that you want to test. If it's a file server, we can run a script. Uh, there's hundreds of, of ways that we can go about doing the testing, but you pretty much set the criteria for what you want to test. So, if, if again, if it's a file server, you want to verify that there's a certain share that's on there and there's data in there where we can do a search for a particular share if that's what you wanted to do. Um, again, if it's an exchange server, um, you can give us a user's name, and we can go and pull data out of a user's mailbox. We can verify that there's data in that user's mailbox. Okay, yeah, very very thorough. Um, another question here, James is asking, what options do you have for training, if I want to get training on the Unitrend solution? So uh, we have uh, training that's available online. All of our training is actually online, and uh, we offer our training at no cost. Okay, nice. And then Bruno had a question about, um, like, how small does the Unitrend solution start? Um, does it work for, you know, small companies as well as large? Absolutely. So the Unitrend's appliances, uh, we start off at a two-terabyte appliance and scale all the way up uh, to a 120-terabyte appliance. Very nice. Um, another question here, can Unitrends provide DRAS for workloads that are running in AWS? Uh, so as far as the workloads, no. Today, no, we don't have the ability to do that. Um, we do have the ability to replicate the data up to uh, AWS, but if you have a workload that's running in uh, Azure, we do have the ability to back up those workloads. Okay, nice. Well, I think that's all the questions we have right now, but we got a lot of feedback here. Uh, great presentation, uh, excellent presentation, people who are using Unitrends already. Uh, and enjoying the solution. So thanks for being on the event today, Jay. All right. Thank you. For more information on Unitrends, visit unitrends.com. Also check out the handout that you can download right there in your audience console. Uh, That handout is the Unitrends Backup and DRAS IT Buyer's Guide. So make sure that you check that out. All right. Now it's time to give away another grand prize and another Amazon $500 gift card. We have an Amazon $500 gift card going to Daryl Beard from Louisiana. Congratulations, Daryl Beard from Louisiana. And another Mac Mini going out to Naeem Ahmad from Texas. Congratulations, Naeem Ahmad from Texas. Stay tuned because we have another grand prize and another gift card coming, uh, being announced after our next presentation. All right, now it's my pleasure to introduce our next presenter on today's Data Protection Megacast. That is Mr. David Clements, Principal Solutions Architect at Igneous. David, are you with us? Yes, hi, David. Hi, David. Thanks for being on the event today. Take it away. 
Thanks for having me. Um, so I'd like to introduce everybody to the world of unstructured data management. Um, Igneous provides uh, unstructured data management, which is the management of all of your file and object data. And we do this um, delivered as a service. So I'm David Clements, um, and I have experience in both managing these uh, very highly challenging um, uh, high capacity environments, as well as experience in the uh, vendor side, um, providing solutions to these types of environments. Um, I'm going to start us off with a, a poll question um, to get a feel of uh, how much of this file and object data does your entire organization store or manage. Um, this is largely um, machine or project generated data um, that you'll find um, where you get to the kind of these really large sizes. Um, it looks like uh, we're starting to see some responses coming up, and that's good. It looks like we have a good mix, and ex you know, this is pretty much kind of the expected mix. Um, we have lots of uh, organizations that have, you know, the under 250 terabyte type of range, but then we have this class of customer, you know, that we, that we work with a lot that are really up in the multi-petabyte type range. Um, and so I think for you guys, you'll find this uh, very valuable and interesting. And uh, for the people with the smaller environments, you may not have the same sets of problems as the larger environments have, but you still will find interest in um, what can be done with that data. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and move on to the um, end results here. So it looks like we've got 25% um, of the environment is up over a petabyte. Um, and then the rest is up under a petabyte. So imagine um, you're responsible for protecting and archiving billions of files and petabytes of unstructured data. Um, you're at a point where your business users aren't satisfied with missed SLAs for, for data protection. Um, or the performance impacts that it has on their applications. Um, and for some of the data, just assuming you can even back that data up at all. Um, or you've got issues with replication being too costly. Um, you require multiple solutions. Um, there's continuous oversight required in that area, very complex licensing, and it's resource heavy to manage. So getting your backup and archive data to the cloud um, feels nearly impossible due to cost and clunky kind of data movement tools. And just understanding what you have takes months before you can decide which data sets to protect, what needs to be retained on primary storage, what you can archive, or what you can just delete or remove. Now imagine if you could have one solution to back up and archive your entire file and object environment. Imagine if you can scale to those tens of billions of files and hundreds of petabytes. Imagine if you can continuously see what data is ready to be archived, what should move to another tier, uh, what can migrate to another data center, to the cloud, and into these uh, new kind of cloud-based file services that are coming out. Um, imagine this is delivered as a service. It's fully monitored and managed. Every job is audited in real time, and every operation is taken care of for you. So this is Igneous. This is Ignis's customer's reality. Um, we have customers like Allen Institute um, that have, say we're the cornerstone of their ability to organize and move and protect their data sets. Um, we also have customers um, in these very challenging environments that say our tools are 100 times faster than any of the other tools that they've experienced in the past. 
and everything works. Um, we've got customers like Altius um, that can now focus on the business and moving the science forward and not have to be spending a lot of time um, kind of working around um, the very large data challenges. And we're proactive in managing the systems, including things like capacity monitoring, um, as well as the auditing of every job that runs. So um, I'd like to go out to the next kind of poll and see if we can get an understanding um, of where you house all of this unstructured data you have today. So if you think about um, all of this, uh, if you can um, go ahead and choose all that apply. Um, many of you probably have heterogeneous environments with multiple um, solutions within your environment. So we'll give uh, people a chance to fill that out. Um, so a lot of times these environments, if you think about them, they're um, environments like um, high-tech manufacturing sites, life sciences and healthcare environments, finance services, finance data, media and entertainment. Um, these are all these where these, this data are assets of their organization. Um, and, they, and they grow into a very large number of um, important assets to organizations that they, they need to be able to answer questions about their business. All right, I'm going to go ahead and move this forward and look at the results. Oh, it looks like we don't see the results slide on this one. Hopefully you guys can see this result um, slide right here. Um, and it looks like we have um, a lot of people who have their data um, residing out on a variety of NAS solutions um, uh, to the public cloud. Um, and there, you, there's a lot of people who are really taking advantage of on-site object storage, um, as well as the kind of the core uh, Dell EMC and NetApp um, solutions that are out there. And, and we do have some people that are actually um, testing out newer solutions like Pure Flash Blade and Cumulo. So unstructured data management, um, what is that, right? It's, it's visibility organization, protection, and mobility of that data. Um, and so we focus in these areas, um, and we do this um, anywhere at scale for everyone. Um, so, so when you're talking about visibility, that means we're gonna help you organize and find and understand that data. Um, we're gonna help you move it, copy it, sync it, and automate those processes as well as protect by backup archive and have the ability to recover. Um, we can do this uh, anywhere. So on-prem or in the cloud, um, on all of the different kind of storage platforms that you're using today. Um, at scale, as we talked about earlier, um, where we're talking about billions of files and petabytes of data. Um, and for everyone, um, meaning not just the operations team, but the operations team's customers or the business users or those tech users within your environment um, that are touching that type of data. So this is um, delivered in you know, our product form. Um, our products are data discovery, data flow, and data protect. Um, and uh, those are the, where we kind of focus um, in attention to, to allow you to kind of focus in on what you need the most. So a lot of our customers, initially, they really just need data protection, right? They have a huge amount of data, and it's a, it's a problem um, for them not to protect it. And then they kind of advanced into a state where they start to really need to understand that data further so they can make decisions on the ability to maybe either archive that data um, or copy and move it um, between tiers or between sites um, or between platforms like going up to the cloud. Um, so when we say that we can do that anywhere, we're talking about it being on-site and off. Um, any NAS uh, platform that's out there, any public cloud, um, and uh, all file and object protocols. 
We do this at modern scale. Um, we call it modern scale because for a large, lot of you that are in the you know, 250 terabytes and below, um, what you're probably seeing is, is the beginning of an explosion of data growth in this area. So initially, um, you might be seeing growth in the area of 10 or 20 percent. Um, but over time, that starts to really escalate into huge um, growth over the next few years. Um, and as people are taking advantage of that data um, to understand um, their business, this will grow even further as they find more value in that data. So at modern scale, that means billions of files, thousands of, of exports, you know, or shares from within your environment, um, hundreds of petabytes, exabytes of data, um, and to have the ability to um, scan and index up to a billion and a half files per hour per job within our environment. And to be able to move that data at line speed, you know, up to hundreds of terabytes or 100 terabytes per day, depending on your line speed. Um, and built for the data owners and the apps and their pipelines and then be API enabled and, and so that they can integrate this into their business um, process. And this is all delivered fully managed as a service. And so what that does is it changes the time to value from, uh, you know, to days versus weeks. I mean, if you think of traditional services out, solutions out there today, by the time you order and get these things up and running, that could take weeks. Um, and we're talking about being able to deliver this in days. Um, also to be able to get much more efficiency out of your resources. It's a fully managed service. So our customers are telling us that they're getting 95% FTA um, reallocation for this unstructured data protection operations. Um, so when you're in these environments with petabytes or even tens of petabytes, I mean, there's these daily meetings you have just to kind of manage and get your hands around um, data protection alone, um, let alone having the ability to respond to your customers' requests um, to build value into um, the operations services um, and their workload in their environments. So uh, hopefully um, I've given you a chance to understand a little bit about Igneous. Um, you can visit us at www.igneous.io. Um, we're here to help you see, organize, protect, and move your data. Um, and uh, and uh, uh, feel free to come and reach out to us. We'd love to talk to you. Great presentation, David. A really innovative solution you, you all have at Igneous. Something that's you know, unique on today's event. So uh, cool presentation. Let's see what questions we have for, from the audience. Uh, while I ask you the questions, I'm gonna pop up this poll question for the audience. It says, would you like to be one of the first to learn more about the Igneous solution? Uh, so question here from Missy, she's asking, uh, are there any APIs that interface with the, AP, with the uh, Igneous solution? Yes, yeah, so all of our, the, the whole kind of data flow category is the, the API um, interface. So um, you can make uh, any, any uh, data protection or movement call through the API. Um, any calls that you make through the API, um, get any of those jobs get fully audited from, from uh, our service delivery and shows up in the user um, interface um, so that you can see those activities and where they stand just as if they were ran through the user interface directly. Okay, very nice. Uh, let's see, another question here they're asking, like, what's the, the pricing and licensing model on the Igneous solution? How does that work? Um, sure. So we license our service by capacity under management. Um, so uh, a backup and archive is available in a single license. So that's via our data protect service. Um, and, uh, and you, you know, other than that, it's all just a, a capacity based license of, of what's under management within your environment. And we're never sitting in path as your primary um, storage device. We're there for the workflow and the movement and the management. 
Okay. And uh, let's see another question here. Can you kind of go over the use cases of Igneous again? I mean, what's the primary use case or the most popular use case? Sure. So a lot of our customers start off, the primary use case is uh, data protection for their unstructured data environment. They'll have a heterogeneous environment with multiple type of NAS solutions, or they'll have things like in media entertainment, they might have store next mixed in, um, or they'll have some object storage solutions that they've built in the environment and they just really haven't had a way to take, make full utilization of that object storage. Um, and so they'll come in and we'll act as either a, a data protection or an archiving type solution. Then from there, they, they work um, into really kind of getting into uh, discovery of the environment where you can get an understanding, I mean, basically down to the file level of what your data sets are and where they reside. So you can make decisions as to whether or not they're residing on the right platforms. Um, whether or not they need protection or, or if they need to be just simply archived out of the way for future use um, or for compliance reasons or if that data can be removed. And then we also have customers that are kind of in the research, AI, machine learning um, kind of environments that come straight in through data flow. Um, they have these type of like iterative workflows where they have very a variety of different data sets that they're moving into maybe a high performance compute environment. Um, and they'll need um, different sets of data to, do, to run different jobs against. Um, and when they're done running those jobs, um, they need that data to kind of be living someplace else so they can move the next set of data into that high performance compute environment um, without having to kind of keep everything in that a very expensive environment. So we also have people come in directly through that avenue and, and want to build their workflows um, and their orchestrators um, to use our engines to, to manage that data. Okay. And how does Igneous move file and data, or file and object data at such a high performance rate? How is that possible? Okay. So, so we kind of have three key things to help us with performance. First, um, we optimize and operate for the data profile. So that's large files or small files. Uh, you, you would definitely handle large files completely different than you handle um, a, a huge amount of small files. Um, and, and so we have special clients that focus and, and can work specifically on those types of that data profile. Um, and then we um, intelligently fill and throttle as necessary the pipes being used. Um, so that we can monitor things like latency and, and ensure that we don't overfill um, a pipe that is causing impact to other workloads. Um, and then um, we're basically containerized or microservices multi-threaded architecture. Um, so jobs can just scale out at a high rate as necessary um, to handle the workload. Nice, nice. And then let's see, uh, last question I think we have time for. Richard is asking, um, do you have deduplication um, in the Igneous solution, dedupe and compression? Yes. So, so that's a good question. Um, we do have um, primarily compression is what we see the most um, reduction because instead of talking about deduplication, um, in this world, it's more like infinite versioning is what we have. So a lot of this is, this is a very large amount of data and they're usually quite valuable to the organization. So really what they're looking at is I need to have the ability to have a copy of each version of the data, but what I don't need to do is run a full backup, have the same data um, multiple times, and then have to dedupe across it. Um, so we, so in our, you know, in our world, what we get is we get, um, infinite versioning of the files so that you can have each version of it as needed. And then you get a compression rate, um, just basically equivalent to any other compression rate like you get in your environment, either if, if it's um, um, that, you know, compression algorithms that you're using on your systems or um, that you're using as you push out to tape. Okay, nice. Well, let's see, I think that's all the questions we have uh, here in the live session. Um, Really great presentation, really insightful. Thank you so much for being on the event today, David. Thank you. I appreciate it. Hopefully we'll hear from a lot of the, from a lot of you out there. <laughs> I hope so. Uh, for more information on Igneous, of course, visit their website 
and also check out the handout that's available for download right there in your audience console. Uh, that handout is a white paper on the Igneous Unstructured Data Management Solution, so make sure that you check that out. And with that, it is time to award our final prizes on the event today. Um, we have another Mac Mini to give away and another Amazon $500 gift card. The, just looking at uh, some of the feedback that came in. Good feedback, yep, thank you. Uh, so I'm gonna pop up this final poll question, just leave that up. If you already answered this poll question, don't worry about it. If you have yet to answer it, then uh, I would appreciate you answering it. And the final prize winner for an Amazon $500 gift card is Dylan at Atterbury from Kansas. Congratulations, Dylan from Kansas. And the final grand prize is going out to Steve Acuna uh, from Illinois. Congratulations, Steve. You won an, uh, a Mac Mini for your home lab. I hope you enjoy it. Those are the final prizes on today's event. If you did not win, I hope that you, you will join us on an upcoming event. In fact, if you go to events.actualtechmedia.com, you can register for all of our upcoming events. Uh, and each one has uh, some really great presenters, really interesting, different topics, all related to enterprise technology and maybe some really cool prizes as well. So um, our next event, our next megacast actually is next week on February 19th covering enterprise security. So I hope that you'll join us for that event. If you are a potential sponsor of a megacast or ecocast event, feel free to email us at sales at actualtechmedia.com and we can chat about how you might want to present on an upcoming megacast or ecocast. And with that, we've reached the end of today's Data Protection Megacast. I hope you really enjoyed the event and learned a lot. Uh, thanks for joining us on today's event. See you next time. Bye-bye.